Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. Perhaps no other area is as maligned and misunderstood about science than uncertainty. Many people think that being uncertain about the final results is a, is a, is a bug, but it's actually a feature of science because science is the only area of human intellectual activity where we can quantify our uncertainties. We can quantify the impact of what we don't know on the predictions we make and talk about the likelihood that our predictions are going to be accurate with a quantifiable, certainly a 95% or 99% likelihood that, that what we're predicting to happen will happen. And, and that's incredibly important because in most other areas of activity, we just make wild guesses about that. My guest on this program is a physicist, Tim Palmer, who's worked in a wide variety of areas, all relating fundamentally to the nature of uncertainty. He's uh, initially was a uh, studied general relativity and was going to go into general relativity and cosmology, made a crucial career change and moved to meteorology and ultimately to climate change. And his work is not just in trying to uh, utilize this, this, our, our, the, the impact of uncertainty on our predictions in general, but to explore systems that are so complex that they have chaotic behavior. And in those systems, very small departures from initial conditions can, in certain circumstances, produce wildly different outcomes. And it's important to be able to understand those systems and to utilize intrinsically that uncertainty to be able to make predictions with any kind of accuracy uh, and any kind of likelihood distribution about what's going to happen. Tim has recently written a book called Primacy of Doubt, where he's talked about his own experiences across the wide range of of, uh, of physics that he's explored, and also more generally in society, from economics to medicine, and even to fundamental science, which we talk about, quantum mechanics and, 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 uh, and, and the fundament fundamental nature of physics. But that key aspect, which is often described as a butterfly flapping its wings in Kansas, can ultimately result in a, in a tornado in the, in, in, the, in the East Coast. The fact that chaotic systems can, can, uh, can change dramatically in their outcomes when initial conditions are not known perfectly, and we can never know initial conditions perfectly, is incredibly important. How can you, how can you handle that as a scientist? And he's talked about the ways that he and others have developed algorithms, um, ensemble predictions that allow us to be able to say uh, with confidence what might happen in a chaotic system and talk about the outliers, talk about the likelihood that there'll be extreme weather in, in a day or a week, and also to talk about the, the possibilities for the future, long-term future in climate change, which is obviously incredibly important for uh, uh, planning by uh, politicians and society in general. And the fact that, that chaotic systems can have behavior which is not quite non-intuitive is very important. And to utilize that in your calculations, not to ignore it, but make a central part of your calculations, the insertion of uncertainty and variation is uh, a remarkable, basically new area of science, which is uh, increasingly important in, in uh, a wide variety of areas of physics and of course in our ability to determine our own future. I think you'll find the discussion remarkable and very illuminating, as I did, and you can watch it without any uh, advertisements on our Substack site, Critical Mass, or you can of course watch it later on YouTube or listen to it on any podcast site. Whether you watch it or listen to it, I hope you'll consider subscribing at least to Critical Mass because those paid subscriptions support the Origins Project Foundation, which supports the podcast and the other uh, activities that nonprofit activities that we do. But whether you watch it or listen to it, I think you'll find your view of the world will be altered in an interesting way by this remarkable discussion with Tim Palmer. Well, uh, Tim, thank you very much for uh, for uh, being on the podcast, agreeing to do this across the ocean. It's nice to have you. Thanks, Lawrence. It's good to be here. And um, uh, I I'm excited to talk to you because I think uh, well, I want to I'm going to hold this up, which is uh, which is uh, I can see it backwards, but it's um, it's the primacy of doubt, which is a lovely title uh, of the title of your book, and and. When I heard about the book, and uh, um, I was really excited to do it because I've often said that that uncertainty 
is the least understood aspect of science among the public, but also the fact that science is uncertain is its strength and not its weakness. And yeah. people don't understand that. And we'll go through that. But I mean, basically, I assume you'll agree with me at this, but science is the only area. The science defines, allows one to me define what one means by uncertainty. It's the only area where you can say with any confidence what your confidence is. And and that's exactly. Uh, I mean, you know, I often say, you know, a good a good hallmark is uh, is the fact that in science, you know, we try to put error bars on our predictions and so on. And you can kind of tell the difference between science and non-science. You go to an astrologer and ask them the error bars on the prediction that you'll meet a tall, dark stranger <laughs> in a week's time. You won't get one. And uh, that's yeah. probably telling you it's not great science. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if in fact, it's in some sense without if people don't tell you the, the, the likelihood or the, the uncertainty in what they're in what they're saying, in some sense, you should always doubt it more. And that's the other meaning of doubt that you don't mean in this book. Uh, not that we should doubt science, but that there's doubt in, in the sense of uncertainty in whenever we say anything. In fact, I'm often asked in the media whether I believe something. And I always say, I try to always say anyway, that the word belief is not a word that scientists should use. In science, something is either more likely or less likely. And that's it. Right. It's never, and, and, and if it's extremely likely, we tend to say it's going to happen. If it's extremely unlikely, we say it's not going to happen. Right. But, it, but, we, but we, we don't think belief, which implies some kind and of... And I, you know, I use, I use that example. If, 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 you know, if, if the weather forecast says there's an 80% chance of rain tomorrow, does that mean you believe it's going to rain or you believe it's not going to rain? Well, it obviously doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, yeah. you just say there's an 80% chance of rain and you determine from that what your action is going to be you're going to take an umbrella to work or you you know you're going to not have a picnic whereas otherwise you would do and then that's relevant really when it comes to talking about climate change because people really do use the word belief mm -hmm. uh, about climate change and again it's really just as irrelevant actually that word as it is for a weather forecast you know we try to make our best probabilistic predictions of climate change you know knowing all the uncertainties that we have in making uh, making such predictions. And it's really not a matter of belief or disbelief. It's whether you think the probabilities are high enough that it warrants taking action or not, like whether you take your umbrella to work, do you cut emissions? It's kind of, in a sense, no different, but it's at a bigger scale. It's a much bigger scale, and we'll get to it. And I think the point of the book, in some sense, is, is how to take that kind of colloquial thinking and, and make it more rigorous. And, right. uh, and, 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 and which is not at all an obvious or immediate uh, route. And, and yet, the, the, as we'll talk about, the consequences are much more, can be much more significant than whether you just get wet. And, uh, and although we will talk about meteorology. And, and, but the other thing I want to point out, which I, which I hadn't realized when I picked up the book, that it's not just about understanding the nature of uncertainty in science, but it's actually something more interesting, that uncertainty is, you thinking about uncertainty is useful in, in, in certain instances, uh, in understanding how the science works, that right. uncertainty is a, is a window into the, the, the dynamics of systems that you wouldn't have if you didn't consider uncertainty. And moreover, something that was actually new to me, although I knew it in the context of sort of quantum mechanics, which we'll get to, but that adding uncertainty in the case of noise, adding noise to a system sometimes makes the signal stronger. And that's, right. that goes completely against conventional wisdom. We talk about signal to noise ratios, and we usually trying to think, make the signal above the noise. But for some right. systems, you argue, for, particularly for nonlinear systems, and we'll, we'll get into that and in, in, in what nonlinear means, um, yeah. uh, that adding noise actually in, can, can sometimes allow you to distinguish a signal that wouldn't not be so clear otherwise, or stabilize yeah. a signal that might, wouldn't be stabilized otherwise. Um, that's right. It, I yeah, sure. I use. I mean, I use. I use the example of of uh, the uh, uh, MIT meteorologist Ed Lorentz, who is kind of often seen as the father of chaos theory. Yes, but really, his 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 really, I you know, and I write about it in the book. His kind of profound uh, discovery was, you know, to try and understand why are chaotic systems so difficult to predict? Why does uncertainty sort of explode? 
uh, when you have these chaotic systems like, you know, like the weather yeah. and many other examples. Um, and you kind of realize that there's a type of geometry. So to understand that uncertainty, you, you, you kind of, uh, he discovered this new type of fractal geometry, which would have been completely alien to, you know, the classical physicists of Newton and so on. So that's a great example about how really trying to, you know, characterize uncertainty has led you into new ways of thinking and characterizing, you know, the physics of systems. And I think that's a really, really, really profound uh, discovery of his. In that yeah, sense. I think, I mean, you spent devote a lot of time in the book to it, and we'll go through it. I mean, I think it, yeah. to, par to parsing that, because it takes a little while to to understand what that means, but the significance right. of that for, for, um, for understanding physical systems first, and then for the areas in which you've spend a lot of your time, which is meteorology and then climate science, right. particularly for those systems. And I want to get to it. I will say at the beginning, I, I think you defined, described the beginning of the book with a, there's a paragraph early on, which says, um, there are two reasons, basically, um, uh, you, you talk about risk analysis, but you're saying there more or less there are two reasons for doing risk analysis, but I think of it as two reasons for writing the book. First, there's the practical reason that we're liable to make lousy decisions if we base them on predictions with unreliable estimates of uncertainty. But just as important, for, at least for me as a scientist, we may be able to understand better the way systems work by focusing on the ways in which they can or uh, in which they are or can become uncertain. These reasons form the two themes of my book, the science of uncertainty to predict our uncertain world and to understand our uncertain world. So there's a, a bicameral theme there. There's sort of developing a science of, uh, of uncertainty and then uh, and then and uh, then also using it to understand our uncertain world which are, right. which are different <clears throat> things and and i've always thought of it in terms of understanding in our, our uncertain world but but we develop techniques and um but to talk about before we get there and and yeah. and we've taken longer to get to this point <laughs> than i usually do no no i right. it's an origins podcast and and i want to talk about your origins which you which you describe in the book a little bit but i think it's an interesting uh interesting uh, voyage you took to get where you are, right? Um, which is to many places. I mean, the, the, y y your your interest is is so your interests are so broad, and 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 I know uh, <clears throat> one one person has described you, I think, as a polymath, which I think is the nicest thing you can ever be called. And <laughs> right. and um, uh, um, they're very broad, but but um, but your interest began actually in in more theoretical areas of physics and general relativity. But I want to go back before that. Right. I want to. I want to ask, uh, what led you to science? Are your were your parents scientists or no? Or... Uh, no, actually, and um, uh, quite the opposite. Actually, my my uh, I had a brother and sister who were somewhat older than me. Um, ni neither of whom, nor my parents, were interested in science. But um, my parents, not so much. But my brother and sister were very kind of political people. And I can remember watching, you know, watching the news and um, either my brother or sister would say, you know, oh, that guy's a, you know, that guy's a rogue. You're talking about a politician or a member of parliament. Yeah, that guy's sure. a rogue. He should be drummed out, you know. And they talk about some, you know, new policy from the government. Oh, that's nonsense. That'll never work, you know. And I'm kind of thinking, how do they make up their minds so quickly? You know, I, I I would need to kind of see both sides of the story and then weigh it up, you know. And and it kind of made me realize I'm not a I'm not cut out to be a politician. I don't have that intuitive sense of what's kind of right or wrong. I'm I'm always kind of weighing up things. So I think rather than that's I mean, very that, appropriate that kind of steered, given the topic of your book when one thinks well, about yeah, it. Well, yeah, that's right. But that kind <laughs> of steered me away. Uh and then at the same time. I mean, this was a great era when people like Fred Hoyle, mm -hmm. Herman Bondi, you know, the, these were the great cosmologists of the kind of, you know, what would you call late 1950s? Yeah. You know, they would come on TV at prime time and just give this extemporized lecture on, you know, on the universe. And uh, I just remember thinking, wow, that's just so fantastic. You know, listening to Fred Hoyle talk about... Uh, you know, there was no beginning to the universe and blah, blah, blah. And uh, that got me hooked. So so, uh, so by the time I was a teenager, I, I was completely hooked on, you know, Einstein and uh, cosmology and all that stuff. And that determined what I wanted to do. Ah, so, okay. so, so it was the popular works of people like Hoyle and, and, and others. I mean, Absolutely. you know, I, for yes. me, too, it was popular books by scientists. And I've said it many times on this podcast. That's one of the reasons 
one of the reasons why I, I wrote books in return because, you know, yeah. it's a, the idea that I might excite some young person. It's happened every now and then, but, but it certainly, it certainly was it for me, which is why I like to encourage people when they're reading books about science to read books by scientists if they can. That's not, not to put down science journalists, and there's some excellent science journalists, but it's, it's, it's nice to get that horse's mouth. And, and, and Hoyle, I mean, Hoyle, but of course, at the same time, people suffered, right? Hoyle was a remarkable scientist. He also was a great popularizer. He also was a great writer. His, his book, right. uh, his, his science fiction yeah. book, The Black right. Cloud, is, is, is right. the best science I was Yeah, I used about. to read his science fiction stories as well. I, I was just devoured everything by these people. Yeah, so, well, yeah. I mean, it's probably, I think, uh, I was talking to my friend Richard Dawkins, and I think he, we both kind of agree that The Black Cloud may be one of the best science fiction stories ever written. But yeah. it's interesting that Hoyle, I mean, he, he, was on the, he was on the wrong side of history, at least in terms of the Big Bang, although he invented the term. But, but um, and that may have been part of it. But he, you know, it's unfortunate. You think of people like him and also Sagan. But, but Hoyle is a great example of a scientist who pro was undervalued as a scientist and probably, one might say, would have, and one can say, could have easily, and was deserving of the Nobel Prize that was given to people he worked with. For, right, you know, indeed. for the seminal work he did in cosmology. And so sometimes, right. unfortunately, popularizing is viewed as a negative and yeah. has been viewed as a negative in the community. I don't think so much anymore. Um, but I, I just but, want to know, say that, um, you know, I, I hope that history will prove Hoyle right yeah, in the yeah, sense yeah. that the Big Bang isn't the beginning of time. Uh, you you may not agree with that, but but uh, you know. So I think you know we may reevaluate not not the precise steady state theory, but we reevaluate his his philosophy, and maybe show that that wasn't so far off the mark. Yeah, no, no, you you know I'm I I view you as part of the part of the intent of the book, which I which which we've talked about before we came on on the air here, is is to um is to argue um heretically about a number of things and 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 you and you make interesting arguments for some really deep issues in in physics one of which is is the nature of quantum mechanics uncertainty which you might get to and the other is the sort of nature of cosmology and the big bang and what we're whether we're seeing is illusion to some extent influenced by and the two, I think your Lawrence, colleague... I, I would i would just say in my mind those two problems are related They're yeah not you, so... you yeah you describe clearly that you think one is related to the other right. and, and i think you're influenced by your, your colleague in some sense roger penrose who, who i have had lengthy discussions with and i don't agree with about some of these things but right but, um but i kind of think kind of interesting that you're that you i hadn't occurred to me that you served in some sense to um ra rise up or, or or defend two scientists who are great in their own terms and both have been recognized in their own terms, Hoyle and Einstein, from from what you might other people might have said their follies. One of one would have said Hoyle's folly is not is not recognizing the Big Bang happened and Einstein's folly was not accepting quantum mechanics. And you right. argue they're actually both right and they're both right <laughs> for the same reason. But that's the latter part of the book, which which we may get to. But I, I think that's a more um, controversial. It's you argue. It's you agree. It's a more controversial uh, Absolutely. discussion, and one that I think is for the purposes of of if we can get there, fine. But for my purposes, what's really important about about this particular book and about your discussion is helping people understand how uncertainty works in science, and and more importantly, in real world issues like meteorology and particularly climate change, how how it's implemented, because you have a long history in that area. And it's back speak getting to history. Let's get back. So you Hoyle and others. Did you read Asimov? Did you read all those people too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a few. Yeah. Feynman, um, by the way, did you ever read Feynman? Uh, well, Feynman in in what sense? In the well, I his mean, popular books, his popular books. Anyway, um, you know, yeah, I mean, not perhaps not as many as others, but yeah, I'm certainly aware. Yeah, of well, Feynman. I mean, you're more. I mean, and by the way, Br you're British. You're more influenced by the British exactly. cosmologists. Yeah. But by the way, I should say that the, the phrase, the primacy of doubt, actually, I took from the biography of Feynman by James Glick. You know, he yeah. believed, he, Feynman, believed in the primacy of doubt, not as a blemish on our ability to know, but as the essence of knowing. I just, exactly. I still find that an absolutely knockout uh, sentence. It's, it, it, it is. And, and you may not know, um, but I will say it here is I, one of the books I'm happy, I've written, I wrote a scientific biography of Richard Feynman, which kind of complements Glick, Glick's thing. And, and, and his, and, and, and that aspect of, 
well, that fundamental aspect of skepticism, uh, which is really what it's all about, is so such so, so so important, and Feynman utilized so so much in his own work, and in, and then later on his public work. So yeah. Anyway, I didn't know whether Feynman reached across the Atlantic as much as Bond uh, as as Hoyle and yeah, and yeah. Uh, the rest. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, but you so you were hooked, and you were you're going to do general relativity, which you did do. We went and did it and did a PhD in general relativity, right? Working with um, Dennis uh, Sharma. Dennis Sharma, who's you Dennis, know, who, was a, who was a supervisor. Very influential. Men- yeah. yeah. A British cosmologist, very influential. He he famously uh, supervised Stephen Hawking in Cambridge. He famously uh, convinced Roger Penrose to move from being a pure mathematician to a, uh, to a mathematical physicist. Um, and he's had numerous uh, really uh, illustrious students. I- I'm a kind of minor student of, of Sharma's, but there are lots of very, very, very is, big is, names. Is Martin Rees something? Did Martin? Martin Rees is yeah. Martin Rees is one of Dennis's yeah. students. He yeah, was he's one of the basically first. produced. Yeah. yeah. So D- Dennis was a remarkable guy, uh, a really inspirational character, and and uh, yeah, I was I was very pleased to to do a PhD. But then I came to the end of it, and I sort of said, well, okay, I've sort of achieved. You know, my childhood ambition to do a research degree in in general relativity and, you know, black holes and all that stuff. Um, uh, quant- you know, quant- I mean, I, w- I was around when when Hawking first announced sure. the the famous evaporation of, of uh, black holes. So I mm-hmm. I was you know, I went through all of that, you know, quantum field theory and curved space time stuff, you know, and I, I knew that kind of inside out and back to front. But and I, I was given an opportunity to work with Hawking as a postdoc, but I, I then had sort of misgivings about whether that was really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I'd sort of, you know, I ticked off the box of my childhood ambition to do a research degree. Um, but I kind of met, uh, I mean, I don't want to go into this in detail because it's more more detail than you want, but I met somebody by chance who was a very internationally renowned climatologist. And he made me realize that the the kind of mathematics I'd learned, and, and even to some extent the physics that I'd learned, was not actually as totally irrelevant as one might kind of seemingly think at first sight in the in the world of climate physics. I mean, I have a little story about how something called the principle of maximum entropy production, which Dennis was convinced was Dennis Sharma was convinced would explain in a simple way Hawking's evaporation mm-hmm. uh, formula. Uh, this guy told me quite casually, oh, yeah, the new big idea in climate science is using the principle of maximum entropy <laughs> production. And I'd never heard of this damn thing until, you know, a few weeks earlier. And it just kind of knocked me out that, a, a, you know, a, a, a thing which from an obscure area of thermodynamics could equally apply to climate or to black holes. So so that was kind of eased the transition, let's say. And, um, I, and I guess I'd wanted to do, I, I kind of, I guess I wanted to say at the end of my career i don't know if i'm at the, i mean i'm sort of at, mm. at the later stages of it let's say you know that i've achieved something that that hopefully benefited you know society in some way so yeah absolutely. I, I feel you know i feel that's that's been a good thing well so that's interesting um the, mm. i couldn't help thinking as you were speaking of the fact that it's that small um that small perturbation of meeting someone oh. who said something cause such a huge effect and it's almost like something might one call one might call the butterfly effect <laughs> and, and it's absolutely and, it is absolutely the butterfly effect and yeah. uh you know uh, it, 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 it and of course it immediately provokes the kind of counterfactual question what would my life have been like if the butterfly hadn't flapped you know <laughs> yeah. and of course it's an impossible question to answer but i think on the whole i think you know rather I think the way to to approach these questions is not to say, well, what would have happened if the butterfly had flapped mm. the other way? Mm. Just to say, if you know everything you know today, would you have made a different decision? Mm-hmm. And I don't think I would. I think every, you know, given that my that things that have happened in my life, I'm I'm pretty happy with the way it's been. So I I, I would make the same decision again. Yeah, I think. well, so right. Well, you don't have a ch- well, unless, except if if I understand your cosmology correctly you may have that chance again but but um but in general you don't, you don't have the chance anyway so you might as well be happy with what you did on this um, on this epoch of the universe i will not have that chance again but yeah. as you say who knows yeah well i future. yeah i think it's i think you should not hedge your bets right now just enjoy the fact <laughs> that you that you that okay. you're happy with what you did but um no and i brought that up obviously not to completely tongue in cheek because there's a lot of because understanding how how 
small but, perturbations yeah. can have huge impacts is a key part of chaos which we'll get which we'll get to in the book and so it's, I, but I, it's, I do want to can i just make one point which sure. i do feel strongly about if if people you know at a similar stage in their career to me when i was finishing my phd are listening to your podcast yeah um you know you can change fields after your phd you can do you know you can do years of post you can change your field and indeed you know the 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 technical stuff that you bring to a different field you you you'll be surprised that it will be useful uh, even though you know at first sight you may not think so and so i i am a great believer in kind of promoting um you know these programs which which you know which allow people to to swap fields i i feel you know it, it's just completely wrong that we're kind of siloized by the time mm. we're in our mid 20s yeah when yeah. We're, we're you know people are now productive we we don't retire till you know much later than we did 50 years ago uh so you know we shouldn't be completely typecast by our mid-20s and uh, you know the more that can happen the better well yeah absolutely um um not i used to it rings rings uh, important for me for two reasons when i was used to be chairman of a physics department i was talking to students about why to choose physics say instead of engineering or something else and i point out that physicists were doing all these different things because what you learn in physics is basically how to solve problems sometimes when you don't know what the problem is and 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 that skill is portable. But as you, but the more importantly is this notion of lifelong learning. I, right. I less dramatically than you, I, for my, for my entire academic career, I was a professor of astronomy as well as a professor of physics. From every beginning, beginning when I, from the time I, I first got a professorship at Yale and onward, I always had both those appointments. But I actually never took a course in astronomy in my life, and and I certainly did, and and and. And likewise, even though my fields didn't diverge as much as yours, I've often said, and it's true, that I learned much more physics after I got my PhD than before. And I think that's the important thing for people to realize. It doesn't end there, but you're absolutely right. I think too many people are, are just feel that they, they don't want to take that step to study something because they're not certain that they want to do it the rest of their lives, but you're never committed. And That's and, right. Yeah. But it's also that employers, it bothers me that employers, you know, they list all these requirements for jobs. You've got to have N years of experience yeah. in, you know, such and such a branch, N years of experience in computing, you know, and so on and so forth. And it kind of almost, you know, it means you, you'll never get shortlisted. If that's the way the job is advertised, you're coming in from a different field, you won't even reach the shortlist. Yeah. So, you know, I say this to employers as well. You've got to be a bit more farsighted and realize that, you know, uh, you know, it's the way new ideas come. You, new yeah. ideas, in my view, don't typically just pop out of the ether. They they come from people applying, you know, well known fields, well known areas into into new new areas. It's it's transfer of information that that is the kind of innovative thing, not not kind of some something yeah. coming out of completely out of nowhere. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Wall Street learned that. I one year when I taught at Yale, I think four of our five PhDs went to Wall Street. Because Wall Street knew that these people could solve complicated equations, work fifteen hours a day in rooms without windows, and <laughs> and and, uh, and and that and that was a, a skill that was that was very important. And, and I, actually, a, a, another colleague of mine who was a who I worked with, who was a cosmologist and particle physicist, and now is a neuroscientist, um, Larry Abbott at, at uh, now at Brandeis. Um, yeah. I remember at the time. He was look. We were we were joke because this when we were, uh, I was at Harvard. Um, that he would say, "Well, I'm going to go in economics because I, you know the people who so, who who basically solved you know translated first year physics problems into economics won the Nobel Prize. So I just have to, you know, translate second year physics problems in, and I can <laughs> and I can it didn't work. Any any case, we'll talk about economics, which which yeah. which uh, which you try and address, and I think you're by by your discussion it validates. A concern of mine about whether economics really is science but let's get back to to, to this so you did make that you you didn't do the postdoc with 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 um with that's Stephen. right you, ju you decided I, tried, I turned turned it down and and that had you was that really as sudden as you suggest or had it been um, had it been you've been sort of mulling it in your mind for a while well no the, the the problem was you know i i it wasn't i mean what i i'd been mulling it over and absolutely getting nowhere mulling it over i just yeah. couldn't you know i i was i was it just kind of you know the, the phrase paralysis by yeah. analysis yeah i mean that was the problem the more i analyzed the problem the more i i paralyzed myself with indecision 
Mm-hmm. And in the end, you know, I was still trying to finish writing up my thesis. So, and I was saying, that, well, this is just doing my head in. I've got to, I've got to sort of, you know, I've got to shelve this for a couple of weeks and uh, just kind of get on with my life, which I did. And suddenly, you know, I, I don't know exactly when, two weeks later, I kind of walked into my office and it just, it was just obvious. I mean, I don't know why it was obvious and I didn't, I decided not to quiz myself as to why it was obvious, mm-hmm. but I just sat down immediately and wrote a letter to the head of head of the uh, applied maths and theoretical physics department at Cambridge, you know, politely declining the post. And yeah, it yeah. kind of got me interested. I mean, I think that's the, you know, you mentioned neuroscience. I mean, I have been kind of peripherally interested in how the brain makes decisions and, and the sort of functions that go behind decision making. And there's obviously something, you know, slightly mysterious here that, um, you, you, that that somehow by not and you know and we see that many examples of that in in uh, you know Roger Penrose talks about when the the famous idea that got him the Nobel Prize was when he was crossing a busy street yeah. and just dod- dodging the traffic and he didn't quite know what the idea he had but he knew and this is fairly universal there's something about you know important ideas somehow come not when you're focusing hard on the problem, but the brain kind of works in the background and, and mysteriously puts, makes connections, you know, uh, when yeah. you're relaxing or not not thinking hard. And it kind of seemed to me that was actually an example of that. Um, I just, I was just getting myself in a mess trying to think through the problem. You see, okay. Although I, I, I don't want to diverge too much from this, but I, you write a lot about that in the book. It's again, a subject which I say, yes, maybe, but I'm not sure I agree completely. Sometimes, and I think my maybe Einstein is another good example, um, not not in special relativity, but in general relativity, sometimes concerted thinking for a long time also works. And and I think in his oh. case, for 10 years in developing general relativity, focusing on that problem with the laser-like intensity was, pro- I mean, it, it was essential for him, at least, and maybe not for someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there's no doubt that you've got to know your stuff. You know, you can't mm-hmm. you can't have a brilliant idea if you don't know your stuff. So you've got to immerse yourself in whatever it is you're doing. But, I mean, I don't know about whether Einstein, I, I don't recall whether he said or not, whether he had, I mean, like his famous example of the, you know, falling, free falling yeah, in an yeah, elevator. elevator. You know, yeah. was that just something which kind of came to him on a, uh, walking out on a sunny day. I mean, it yeah. probably was, you know, and then he realized from that, everything kind of flowed from that idea. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. His Gedanken experiments were good, but I think the point is, anyway, it doesn't matter. I think he was always <laughs> thinking of Gedanken experiments, not just looking at the uh, sunny day. He was also, while he was looking at the sun, he was thinking, I get right. the sense he was anyway. Right. Um, but but did you do, did you have a job already or did you just turn down this other job without another No, job? I had two well I had two oh. off no I had a uh, I had two offers of a, two two completely different jobs you know one mm. was uh, I, I sometimes put it to work at the second most uh, famous university in the world um, <laughs> with Stephen Hawking um, and the other was just to be a very kind of prosaic scientific civil servant working at the UK's Met office which was a kind of government meteorological service and, uh, and you know, my my parents thought I'd gone completely mad to turn yeah. down Hawking. Yeah. But yeah, um, but I was intrigued. I actually kind of knew that you'd had that. You went to the meteorological service. Yeah. I didn't know you'd have the if you'd had the offer before. But yeah. I'm intrigued in why they made you the offer. I mean, did you did were they very far sighted in saying, well, this person they could were. solve complex they, equations? Or, exactly. Or, or, they at the time, and I, I you know, I, I I'm not sure whether this would happen today. At the time, uh, the then director general uh, a guy called john mason who who himself had been a professor at imperial college um <clears throat> i mean i was told subsequently his his he briefed his uh, the interview committee to just find good physicists and mathematicians and he didn't care whether they knew anything about the weather or not uh, as i say today i'm not sure this would work you know you yeah. the job the job advertisement would would require n years of you know meteorological background but but mason was was um you know i my hope you know thankfully for me far sighted and he just um you know and i could i could witter on about the principle of maximum entropy production and how it was relevant to climate you know really not yeah. knowing very much yeah. about either subject but it kind of sounded impressive and i think the I probably duped the uh, the committee to to give me a job, which was probably I didn't deserve. But you know, thankfully. Well, I don't know. In retrospect, it looks like you did okay. <laughs> um, um, now, but you you know one of the what one of the things about weather 
Yep. Unlike, say, black holes, is that people, is that, as you point out, it has an immediate impact on people's lives. Everyone right. talks about it. Very few people can do anything about it, except doing something about it means maybe anticipating it. And the real problem, the real problem of, uncer of, of uncertainty that you wanted to focus on, you know, we can all say we can measure this with a certain accuracy and that people can understand. But sometimes the question is, how do small uncertainties lead to potentially big effects? And that's where nonlinear systems come in. And that's where, um, that's where, and weather is an example. And you give a great example of a poor guy named Michael Fish. You want to give that example, which I think is important because it, it sort of yeah. illustrates the significance. Yeah. Well, the, the, the point, the point uh, about, uh, you know, uncertainty in a nonlinear system mm -hmm is that the uncertainty is not going to be the same every day. You know, your, your sources of uncertainty might be the same. You know, the fact that the models are, are not perfect and the observations are not perfect. So your kind of it, uncertain inputs are more or less the same every day. But the uncertain outputs uh, will not be the same every day. And some days, you know, the, un the, un the outputs may be pretty certain. Um, on other days, they may be somewhat uncertain. But occasionally they may be explosively uncertain. And, uh, you know, I try to discuss, um, I mean, in fact, right in the very early chapter of the book, I talk about this, the solar system and, you know, planets going around, you know, the end body system. And that can be one which can be actually look pretty damn predictable most of the time, you know, planets going around mm -hmm. in ellipses and just minding their own business. And you start to yawn at the animation and then suddenly explosively out of nowhere, they just buzz off to infinity, you know, and uh, the weather's like this uh, as well. And a great example, uh, which had a profound effect, actually, on, in the UK, was a, um, a weather forecast that Michael Fish uh, came on the TV and he, he, uh, he, he basically said, you know, tomorrow's weather will be pr pretty, pretty average, you know, a bit breezy, but nothing special. And um, pretty much the worst storm for 300 years happened. And, uh, you know, the, the, the town of Seven Oaks in Kent famously became No Oaks, you know, because <laughs> all of it. So, <laughs> no, but I mean, literally, I mean, in today's money, I think, you know, it was billions of, of pounds worth of damage and, um, you know, and, and a number of lives lost. And, um, you know, people were incensed. How could the weather forecast, you know, we pay the Met Office all this money to make forecasts and they talk about all their supercomputers and their satellite data. How can they get this thing wrong? You know, only 12 hours before. And uh, I kind of retrospectively analyzed this case and it was a mm. classic example of this utterly kind of explosive, uh, explosively uncertain uh, system in the sense that, lit well, as, 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 as near as damn you can put in butterflies into a weather forecast model, you can't exactly put butterflies in, yeah. really, but as near as damn, um, you know, within a day they had grown into such amplitudes and scales that they made the difference between, you know, low pressure, in some solutions, low pressures would form, in other solutions, high pressures would form, you know, uh, you could get anything in between. So this was the classic case where you know, it kind of highlighted the fact that, that meteorology, you know, if you wanted to be cruel, you could say meteorology wasn't really a scientific discipline at that stage. At that stage because yeah. it, was like the, it was like the astrologers just saying you will meet a tall, dark stranger without any error bars. It'll be sunny tomorrow without error bars. Mm -hmm. So it kind of convinced me that we've got to do something about this. Um, and in a way that the technique was straightforward, the technical details behind it were complicated, but the technique was in principle straightforward, which is you don't run a single weather forecast, you run 50 yeah. forecasts and you change them by flaps of butterflies wings. And you just it's look to see, is this a day where they all diverge or is this a day where they all stick together? If they all stick together, you can be pretty confident what's gonna happen. If they all diverge, then you can only talk about vague probabilities but if some of the members have extreme weather then at least you can warn people you know of the risk of extreme weather and then that's it's up to them how they decide to take you know to use that information but yeah, at least in fact, them that information. yeah you present a great uh, series of graphs where one doesn't and you're jumping ahead to these ensemble forecasts which is an essential part of meteorology and then we'll get to in climate change it's a right. it's a really eminently sensible idea and i and and um 
um, it, it's at the heart of uh, related to something which which you talk about, and and I've used a lot of my career something called Monte Monte Carlo analysis. Yeah, it's uh, it's, linked, that, it's very much linked to to Monte Carlo. If a compli- if a system is too complicated to follow it through exactly, and you need a computer to do it, uh, you know, if you can't solve it completely analytically, then um, and then if you want to know how things will change, and you the best thing to do is to change it and to put change your input variables and then run this complicated thing and then see what what comes out and and generally that's the way now i mean it's not completely now they do a little more fa- fancy stuff called bayesian analysis but for in the long run that was what experiments did they would in order to estimate when an experiment a physics experiment was measuring something uh, and compare it to theory you'd you have certain intrinsic experimental uncertainties and you would run a simulation with those uncertain randomly choosing among those different uncertainties and seeing what the outputs were and seeing there and that would tell you how accurately you were actually measuring something it's a it's right. a it's a wonderful but, way to compare theory and experiment it's it's eminently right. sensible but, i was surprised that it took so long for people to and that it was actually well, but, hidden for a while it was but, it was top secret yeah, yeah. well uh, yeah but let, let me let me just you know let me be devil's advocate because okay. i i you know i went through you know uh, what may seem obvious today you know it's like it's like things everything in life you know what seems obvious today wasn't so obvious like once you understand it yeah 30 years ago and you know the argument was from my colleagues was uh, because you have to remember when you make a weather forecast um there's a limit you have a limited amount of time to make that forecast on a on a computer, otherwise it just becomes useless. I mean, if it takes you more than a day to make a day's mm-hmm. a day long weather forecast, then there's yeah. no use. Yeah, and um, you know, uh, so so typically, you know, you get observations come in. Uh, you have to you have to kind of assimilate the observations into the model, run the model forward, all in the space of a few hours, and then disseminate the forecast out. So you've got this very tight uh, schedule. So you know, it's not like we could sit back and, and and run these 50 forecasts at leisure. It all had to be done within a very tight schedule. And the argument was, well, okay, you're you're you know, you're you're using up lots of extra computer time to do all these 50 forecasts. Wouldn't it be better to increase the resolution of the model? you know, so that the, uh, you know, the dynamics were more accurate and the the model could assimilate the observations better and so on. So it was not that people, you know, didn't agree in principle with the idea. They just said, look, there are better ways of using our computer time than running a forecast over and over again. (laughs) And actually, well, that's important. Actually, an important point make later on in the book, which is it depends on what you're doing. And there are certain circumstances where it's better to do, it's not always clear that it's better to do one or the other. Sometimes improving Absolutely. the model is better and sometimes Absolutely. running running similar. And of course, a lot of depends on practicality, such as speed of computers and resources, but others Absolutely. sometimes depend upon time available and also the um, the significance of the result, I think. And 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 so, yeah, it's, it's, it's it takes uh, all, it uh, all different approaches are, are, need to be considered and there's not a universal i think in one or the other that's right that's um right. but let, let let me i want to get to i want i want to get to chaos and uncertainty and meteorology and climate and 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 then risk analysis is where i'd like to try and cover th- those topics which are which are at the heart of of, of a lot of the, of the book but the key point is to decide when a system as we say when a small uncertainty What's really relevant for weather and climate and a lot of the things that day to day things like pandemics and economics that you go into and and wars is when a small, small effect has can have a big, a big change in the outcome. And that that requires that can generally only happen if a system is nonlinear. And, and I want so but for the public, I think it's important to, discuss, to explain what we mean by that and why that's the case. So let me ask you to do that. Well, yeah. I mean, when I wrote the book, a kind of an example of a nonlinear system came to mind. So let me, I mean, a nonlinear system is one where, you know, if you sort of double an input variable, then the output variable doesn't necessarily double. You know, it might triple or it might halve or something. So it's not kind of proportional to the change in the input variable. And the example I used was thinking about, uh, you know, not, not that I not that I do this myself, but if you uh, if you were to uh, win, uh, you know, five million dollars or something on the lottery, yeah, 
you you know i mean if i won five million dollars on the lottery i'd be unbelievably happy yeah um if i won 50 million dollars on the lottery i mean i guess i'd be more happy than winning i mean i suppose <laughs> i would i don't know but um i i you know be more happy but i don't think i'd be 10 times happier to have won 50 million dollars and five million dollars so I mean, that's a kind of an example, if you like, if that resonates, I don't know. That well, it's, of, in a sense, it does, although it's although in a sense, it does. But in the sense, it's the opposite direction. Right. Sometimes it goes the other way. We're a small input, a, yeah. a small, uh, a, you know, where whereas doubling something has, doesn't make it two or doesn't make it a half. It makes right. it five or seven or right. ten. And that right. that doubling can become exponential. And then and then you and then. And and you get that's ultimately how for nonlinear systems you 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 can get uh, yes although uh, in the nonlinear system uh, actually what will happen uh, you know uh, errors will will grow and and grow and grow but then they ultimately saturate and uh, you know uh, and then they don't get any larger and that's that's a kind of an, a nonlinear saturation of a of an of an error but the the most important point I really wanted to sort of bring out on all of this is that. You know, because sometimes, sometimes I do get asked this question that you know, you, well, you could you could just look historically at uh, at a load of weather forecasts and work out, you know, on average how 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 skillful or unskillful they were. You know, put your error bar, calculate your error bars from a kind of a, a you know historical set of of forecasts and you know statistically analyze them. And the point is. That that I mean that would be better than nothing, but but yeah. that doesn't take account of the fact that in a nonlinear system, you sometimes get these states which where errors grow slowly and they are kind of relatively unimportant, and other states where errors grow catastrophically rapidly, you know, and it's being able to dis discern and distinguish ahead of time those kind of situations that that's that's really when it becomes important that's and, really what i think yeah that's the heart of the book in fact there's a figure in the book yes. that we get to which i think really right. is really the heart and what really matters if all of this matters is to know when something dramatic is going to happen based on your uncertainties or when you do can ignore the uncertainties to first approximation right. and 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 it's also worth pointing out that not all nonlinear systems are i think are chaotic but i mean you know i mean but but the fact that certain variables depend on the square or the square root or something of any, like distance versus time in physics, you know, the distance right. you're falling down is the square of the time. If you're, if you're falling down in, 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 right. uh, in, in, in due to gravity, which is really not intuitive because you normally ever see it, but you know, that right. you can, you can, your distance increases so much between if it increases by a certain amount between zero and one seconds, you might think it increases the same amount by, one and two, which maybe Aristotle thought, but you know, as Galileo pointed out, it increases a lot more. But there are certain systems where it's not just that 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 things increase; it's where you get this intrinsic uncertainty, which which can be called, which I guess is characterized by this notion of of which I may be due to Lorentz, but deterministic non-periodic flow. The fact that a system, the system is deterministic. It's run by equations that are deterministic, but you don't know the outcome because to know it, you'd have to know every variable infinitely well. And the first, the simplest example, which I think most people don't realize, which you talk about in the book, related to planets, but re even related to pendulums, is is a three body system. Is the fact that if that un, you know, we are all those of us who took physics, and some people have good memories of that, and some are bad. But you know, you remember. The Earth going around the Sun, and it all looks like everything is described beautifully by Newton, and it is. Right. But then you throw another planet in there, or another right. pendulum. In the case of three pendulums, and suddenly, it's possible. It doesn't always happen, but it's possible that all hell can break loose. And the simplest example, as you point out, is if you have three bodies under certain circumstances, they they, they in, well in general you can't describe. There's no way you can know the future history of that system with 100% accuracy. That's right. You can't write down a formula. There's no formula which sort of tells you what's going to happen. And, uh, and uh, that, that kind of shattered a lot of dreams, uh, you know, in 19th century science. Uh, absolutely. Where we th where people thought, okay, once we, you know, with Newton, once you, once you have the initial conditions, the rest of the universe is determined and we can, in principle, predict it if we have a good enough system predicted for arbitrarily far into the future and arbitrarily accuracy and uh, accurately and there are certain systems where that's just simply not possible and it's a it's a shock to realize it but on the other hand as you point out 
when you look at these motion of say three planets or or, or uh, in a, in a certain you know most of the time it's just sensible and then every now and then one something gets knocked off to infinity and then you say well gee what's i'm worried now what yeah. about what about nine planets or if you get rid of pluto eight planets and the sun and then people well, you, know, you start to worry well yeah. are we are we destined to doom and then there, and then one has to understand how to how to picture what's happening so I'll, i'm leading well you i was going to say the 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 i mean i you know it's it seems to be I mean, people do these very, very uh, long uh, calculations of the of the solar system, and it yeah. it seems to be pretty there, unlikely, you know, that the Earth will suddenly get ejected from the solar system. But there's a more practical problem, which is the asteroid belt. You know, we, yeah. the, the motion of the asteroids is essentially unpredictable on long time scales, and and we don't know uh, whether one will get ejected from the belt and ultimately hit Earth. And of course, that can be just as devastating. Uh, as as a nuclear bomb or something hitting hitting a city, so you know that's why NASA sent the um, uh, the uh, the was it DART yeah. or whatever it's called yeah. to um, see whether we could deflect an asteroid. You know, so that that's really a good case of trying to take kind of mitigating action against yeah. an intermittent instability. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll get back to it. I think it's a good example. Remind, I'd like to use it because I was going to use it when we talk about risk analysis. What you know, right. risk versus you know probability of something happening versus its implications, and how right. one and, and 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 so I'd like to try and get there. Um, right. But uh, it's okay. This is, I think, uh, all particularly useful. And the the what is probably worthwhile pointing out is that. The solar system is chaotic. It's known to be chaotic, but it's chaotic in a kind of manageable way, as far as we can tell. And moreover, we use that. And in fact, climate scientists, you have used that ever since the work of a guy named Milankovitch, who who realized that it's actually small scale, you know, but but generally predictable chaotic changes that will produce more or less somewhat cyclical variations in in the Earth's climate, and and um. And so that we we take into account that that chaos and but what we don't want but what some people who, who who like to argue against all evidence would argue well then what we're just seeing is is just that and it's worth pointing out that these are cycles that are over a hundred thousand years or so not over right. 20 30 or 40 years but so we so we can manage i mean chaos doesn't mean you can't do anything there is a science of chaos and that's right. really the heart of, of much of the book and and, and and you talk about Lorenz and and uh, and and, uh, and uh, Lorenz and 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 the, his importance in thinking about this in terms of geometry, and yeah. and I think that distills down. You know, you know, the, fr one can talk about fractal geometry, and it's all very nice to talk about fractional dimensions. It sounds nice, but I think more importantly, operationally, is the notion of attractors. Is that ultimately? You can think of the geometry of a system by thinking about how it move, how how a system changes in what we call phase space, which is just the parameters that you know the distance, you know, or, or some other characteristic. Over time, the system will move through some some region of phase space. Planets that are perfect that are in orbits will will come back to where they began in 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 position, and and we can map out their position. That's the simplest thing. A chaotic system maps out a much more irregular kind of motion and what what uh, uh, what is by far in my mind the most important figure in your book which happens to be figure 10 which really encapsulates everything is the fact that one while it's impossible necessarily you know if a system's chaotic to follow all the trajectories exactly it can be that the trajectories map out a nice shape that has right. that has maybe a bimodal distribution where, right. And it's either and the system either ends on one, say, one plane or another, and right. those are called attractors, right? Right. The well, the the attractor is the overall uh, kind of ge geometry on which the system evolves. But as you say, um, you can uh, you can look at how small, you know, a small ball of initial conditions, you know, would would grow, and it would it would it would kind of grow. It start off looking like a, a kind of distorted banana, or a kind of bent bent yeah. over banana, and then it would start getting more complex and so on. Um, and in a sense, that's really you know that that's what that's what we're trying to calculate in in doing uh, you know probabilistic weather prediction. It's these sort of small shapes and how they deform and, and whether they grow rapidly or or. Or, uh, you know, my or dog, my, my, 
my dog just likes to grow rapidly his excitement every now and then you know, <laughs> but um, and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna lob in uh uh just for the discussion that the equation that describes the growth of these probabilities is actually remarkably similar to the schrodinger equation in many respects uh, and that's kind of motivated me uh you know in in the later more speculative parts of the book to yeah um, to look at that well, the key, the, key, uh, the key point is, I think, not just that you can watch the shape of things change, but the key point is, and this is where I think uh, really the heart of, 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 of trying to deal with people's concerns about drastic events or unlikely events, is that the way is that you can look at a region, so you can map out a region of phase space and say, I don't know what, what the variables, you know, I don't know the position of that particle exactly or what its speed is or that. So there's some ring of uncertainty that we're used to. But what's right. really interesting is in these chaotic systems, you can watch how that ring of uncertainty changes. And depending upon where it, you happen to be right. in the phase space, it will right. change in very different ways. And there are some right. places in this phase space where you don't have to worry very much. It'll change, right. but not dramatically. Right. But there are other right. spaces where all right. hell breaks loose. Right. 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 And I think that's the key point. And if you can figure out a way to find out where you are in that, uh, some estimate of where you are in that, Phase space, then you can say whether extreme events are going to happen with some probabilistic. Um, that's right. That's uh, right. Confidence, and that and that's now you know really that you know people now realize that's really important information. This is not just sort of esoteric abstract science. This is really, you know, this is really relevant. It really is. Now, it's. I'm going to have to take a walk out because I want to see whether the face space of my. I'm sorry, whether the face space of my dog is diverged oh, enough. Or whether okay. I'll just wait one second. Okay. Come on back, guys. See, the the problem is it's nonlinear. I have two dogs here, and and no. and that's <laughs> if it was just one, it'd be easier to handle. But okay. Now you need three dogs though. Before yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. But two dogs plus me is an intrinsically chaotic <laughs> system. Um, in, in any case, um, so really, I want to get back. So that's the key point. If if. Yep. if recognizing first of all that that you've got to find a way to follow uh, quantitatively how your uncertainty evolves and the realization that while you can't do things exactly they're also realize that there are certain places where where things where where that uncertainty can grow and you can say with while you can't map out and say what's going to happen you can say with great confidence that yeah. that that there is a, a distinct possibility which one can quantify w w in probability arguments that something dramatic will happen and that's, that's important right. for for weather for certain but also yeah. for for climate modeling and and that's um right. and and i think that's probably and what you do is beautifully describe that and i think it's really if i were to say the most important aspect for me in 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 in, in what the book really illuminates is exactly how the science has evolved to be able to do that and and one of the ways as you point out it's coming back to what seems eminently reasonable in retrospect which thing most things are in hindsight yeah, uh, yeah. 2020 um is saying well look if 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 we can't model it exactly let's 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 uh take into account our intrinsic uncertainty and our intrinsic ignorance by um by randomly by running a running the system and randomly choosing initial conditions that may be slightly different than the ones I thought I had. And that's what, 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 what I've always thought of as Monte Carlo and you call ensemble, well, I guess an ensemble analysis. What, is there a difference well, in your mind between ensemble prediction and Monte Carlo prediction? Well, uh, so the two things I want to say, the word Monte Carlo, it's very interesting, actually, the word Monte Carlo uh, pretty much came out from the work of uh, of um, of uh, von Neumann and von Neumann. Ulam, um, you know, doing their nuclear bomb testing, and you know they wanted to uh, you know work out how the neutrons were diffusing uh, away without you know using probabilistic equations, which made made everything very complicated. Um, uh, but they and they came up with the word Monte Carlo, named Monte Carlo, because I think Ulam's uncle or something was a great gambler in okay. in the uh, monaco casino um but the but the term was kind of it was kind of kept as a as a bit of a secret you know idea and um at the time there was a guy called chuck leith who worked uh, on this program who subsequently became a um a uh, a climate modeler and actually wrote one of the first uh, papers actually about monte carlo forecasting in, in weather prediction uh -huh. um 
but somehow it was you know it was it was not taken up for for many many years and um uh now the the thing is it it's it, if you this gets a little bit technical but if you just literally ran random if you just add random noise to an initial condition in a numerical weather forecast model um the opposite of what you think might happen happens so the butterflies don't actually grow because mm. right near the grid of these models you have to put in quite a lot of artificial diffusion to keep the model kind of numerically stable mm -hmm. so um typically kind of random perturbations actually decay more quickly than you know in reality so we actually had to work i mean quite a lot of the work i did in the in the 1980s was developing techniques uh you know which actually turned out to be quite mathematical techniques to do with kind of generalized instability analysis where we would actually introduce perturbations that we knew projected onto kind of um finite time instabilities of the system to overcome this problem of just damping by artificial diffusion in the models so it wasn't really monte carlo in the sort of strict sense of the word so that's why i i thought we'll, we'll just we'll just use the word ensemble, ensemble. In, a, in a slightly more sure. generic kind of way yeah well ensemble is a distinct a long history and of a, a distinguished term in physics and in yeah. terms of thinking and just about the first time uncertainty was really incorporated in physics with statistical mechanics and the notion right. of ensembles right. became right. very as a central part of of that that understanding of how a system of many many particles behaving randomly can behave globally right. in ways right. that you can try and understand one of the great triumphs right. of Boltzmann and others right. um, uh, but but when it comes now to this to this um, treating these ensembles you, you spend a lot of time talking about how uh, the science uh, and the history of what's been done in weather yeah. prediction and then more relevant for many people nowadays climate modeling which yep. I want to get to but one right. of the things that, that is actually that I learned that I hadn't really, or maybe I'd forgotten it, but I, it really hit me in reading the book was again from Lorenz, I think, was this limit of weather prediction. We always wonder why, why we're limited by two weeks and why, you know, I remember when I was younger, I couldn't believe it for more than a few days and then, okay, a week I could believe it. And you might figure as you get better and better computers, you'll simply get better and better and better at forecasting in the long term. But in fact, one can say with, with more or less certainty, that there's a limit. There's an absolute limit on your ability to forecast the weather more than two weeks or so. And the reason is, has to do with the, now not the intrinsic uncertainty of, of um, say, the motion of a planet, but now fluids, which have at small and smaller and smaller scales can have turbulence. And, and, and this very important phenomenon, which you also talk about, which I guess I call scaling, you call power law, but, but the notion that, um, that for systems that have the, all these activity on many different scales at the same time, that what happens on smaller scales, uncertainties on smaller scales can blow up much more, much faster than uncertainties on large scales. And, and I think you use the argument that, uh, that if you have a model, a weather model and your grid is say a thousand kilometers or 10 kilometers or whatever, then you might expect that uncertainty to blow up in a day. But if you have an uncertainty of, you know, up 10 meters, you then changes will take place. It'll change things dramatically in, in, in an hour or so. And, and so want to go through the mathematics of that sum, which I kind of like, because it's a sum of an infinite, num uh, infinite number of numbers, which is, which is always right. fine to go back to, uh, uh the first right. person who, who first puzzled over that a long time ago and, and then, and then solved it. Um, the fact that an infinite series can add up to a finite number. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it to you now to go through. Well, that. I mean, j just to say Lorenz's, you know, L Lorenz's famous paper in 1963 was a model uh, which just had three, three variables. Um, and, and it showed this property that, you know, a small amount of uncertainty uh, in one of the variables could eventually, you know, cause the system be to become unpredictable. But that's but that system has what a mathematician would call the property of continuous dependence on initial conditions. So that sounds a bit abstract. So let me put it like this. If you say to me, I want to be able to predict uh, the variables in Lorenz's model, you know, out to uh, two weeks, three weeks, 
three years, 30,000 years, three trillion years. I could tell you how accurately you would need to know those initial conditions to make that prediction. Mm -hmm. And the point is that, you know, for a, no matter how far ahead you want to predict, uh, in principle, you can make that prediction as long as you can kind of bound the initial errors by a certain amount. So, yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, in a way, there isn't an absolute limit to predictability of a simple chaotic system like Lorentz 63. But in weather forecasting, we're not dealing with these kind of very, what are called low order chaotic systems. We're dealing with the, the Navier-Stokes equations, mm -hmm. which is kind of Newton's laws of motion for a, a fluid, which in principle has, you know, an unlimited number of scales. Now you could say, okay, eventually we'll hit quantum mechanics but you know okay well quantum mechanics is uncertain anyway so yeah, let's, we'll let's not let's mechanics. just let's keep <laughs> quantum mechanics out of it we'll just use this classical navier stokes equations which a you know a mathematician would call an infinite dimensional uh, kind of nonlinear partial differential equation which basically means which sounds intimidating certainly it sounds sure. well it is intimidating <laughs> it actually. is intimidating um, it is intimidating um but it basically means it can support you know large uh, whirls and eddies smaller worlds and eddies you know so you know you have you have you know the very large scale weather weather low pressure weather systems embedded in those might be clouds embedded in a cloud is subcloud turbulence embedded in the subcloud turbulence is is you know is even smaller and it kind of just cascades right the way down i mean ultimately to to individual molecules yeah um now <clears throat> lorenz i mean in a in a paper which is not as well known as his 1963 paper, another paper in 1969, he said, how, if I had a little error in one of these really, really, really tiny scales, how quickly or how rapidly would it propagate up to the, the large scale? And this is actually, you know, what he meant by the butterfly effect. It, yes. It's kind of become a bit misused, this term, actually, because it doesn't, what he meant by the butterfly effect doesn't really apply to his three component model. It applies to this kind of Navier Stokes type of equation. Um, and basically, what he showed is something which is kind of mathematically rather interesting, which is that, um, you know, your small scale error will, will grow uh, and eventually, you know, It'll it'll say you know you will lose any predictability in the weather after say two weeks. Now you then might say, okay, well I'll 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 try and reduce the uncertainty to even smaller scales. So it's it's you know I I I'll add some extra instruments that measure you know measure barometers and things which measure the weather. So I'm going to push that uncertainty down to even smaller scales. And what Lorenz says is that your ability to predict is you know, the effect of those extra measurements have a kind of law of diminishing returns. You'll get less and less predictability out from those extra measurements. And ultimately, and as you say, it, it it's a bit like adding, you know, a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth plus a thirty second plus a sixty fourth and so on and so forth. You never get past one. You hit yeah. you will never get past one. That series converges to one. Now, normally, you know, when a you know a mathematician is very happy when a series converges, but mm -hmm. what this means in this case is that there is an absolute limit, you know, which which we do think is around two weeks. I have to. I'm going to call it, could just. I'm going to just say a few words about because I need to quantify that just so people don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But let's say there's a there's a limit of around two weeks, just beyond which you can't you can't predict beyond that, no matter how accurately you know. Um, and this is this is kind of an example of something which is sometimes called a singular limit in the sense that, you know, in a, in a hypothetical sense where you knew everything deterministically perfectly. Yeah, sure. You can, in principle, that predicts infinitely far ahead. But even an infinitesimally small initial uncertainty would suddenly reduce your predictive skill to or predictive horizon to to two weeks. So in practice, that means you just can't predict because you're always going to have at least an infinitesimally small uncertainty. Now, I just want to be clear. I'm not saying you can't because one has to kind of this is an average of two mm -hmm. weeks. And as we were talking about earlier, uh, 
in practice, you know, mm. pra- predictability varies from day to day. So yeah. some days, actually, that limit will be more than two weeks. Yes. Other days, it will be much less than two weeks. So this is an average. Yeah. yeah and the no. other thing is that there are, you know, um, we're talking about a kind of prediction of a an instantaneous weather state. And we know, for example, that when the El Nino phenomenon occurs in the Pacific Ocean, uh, in the tropical Pacific Ocean, that we we know something about the kind of average statistics of weather over, say, the winter or the summer. You know, monsoons tend to be weak when there's an El Nino event. I mean, this year we with the we had the opposite, the so-called La Nina, which actually led to flooding in Pakistan. The two are probably yeah. co- causally correlated. And you know, we know that there is predictability out to several months ahead several seasons ahead actually for, of predicting el nino in the ocean and so that gives a kind of a, a prediction not not on the instantaneous weather but on the sort of average weather so i just want to qualify what i'm saying is you know you, you the the statement about you can't predict more than two weeks is about a kind of a, an instantaneous weather field Inst- on average inst- instantaneous weather field and generally locally i think this we're going to get to, yep. i mean i think it's really important because one of the big differences there's a difference between weather and climate and climate oh, yeah. is over is av- over many places that and, and you know climate is what's happening in a some sense globally over time and 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 weather is what's happening today here and um and and so people often say well how, why should i believe you know climate change when i can't do the weather for more than two weeks why should i believe i'm going to talk about the climate and 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 there's a fundamental difference and i and 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 i and obviously we'll get there um i yeah. hope um you know one of the, one of the one of the things that when you talk just reminded me what in some uh, tell me if you agree with me in this i the, it seems to me the big the challenge that, that's pointed out in this inherent uncertainty of why you can't of of small scales affecting big scales is that in a nonlinear system like that where there's uh, where uh, navier skokes where there's things happening on many scales at the same time in order to know what the system's doing you have to know what's happening on all scales at any one time and that's and that's not possible and it, you know it's and i just want to i can't help but make the analogy f- for why we can understand you might say that should how can we understand fundamental physics and one of the big surprises and wonderful things about fundamental physics that Feynman actually i not sure he appreciated fully when he won the Nobel prize for actually doing it is that it turns out remarkably we have discovered in a rigorous way that one doesn't have to know what's happening on scales we cannot yet measure in particle physics, on scales so small that we cannot yet measure, um, that those things in the theories that we understand, the effects of what happens on very small scales actually disappears when you go to large scales rather than the other way around. And, it, and if it wasn't that way, we could never have a fundamental theory of nature. But, but that's, but, uh, you know, at the fun, at its smallest scales. But that's why it's so hard to have a, quote, fundamental theory of fluids of, of of what's happening in the weather and other things is because it's exactly the opposite that the small scale what happens on small scales needs to be known to what happens to understand on large scales so it's a that's a right fundamental uh, and difference. that's uh, and that's why i argue that uh, you know and i i've certainly you know something i've worked on a lot over the years is that you know rather than just uh, bury your head in the sand and pretend these small scales don't exist or they they're kind of unimportant uh, represent them with noise, you know, with with just uh, you know, good old fashioned sort of what we call stochastic noise, and you do a better job in simulating your large scales uh, with noise, a noisy model, than with with a with a non noisy model. And this is one example of where noise is your friend. You know, yeah. noise can help you. Well, in fact, you 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 could have if you could see my page, you'd see the next thing I was going to talk. I have underlined is adding noise makes things better. And that's the next thing to point out. And it's a really, again, something that I hadn't appreciated personally. You have a great example, which visually we can't do here, about about, um, if you're truncating a system, if you're you're always have a limited number of variables, a limited amount of information to describe a complex system. And 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 if you if you it turns out in certain cases, if you add noise to the to, to to that truncation, then then you get a better representation of what really happens than if you don't add noise, which is really totally non-intuitive and, and, and to- totally counterintuitive, in fact. And what it, what it does is sometimes, uh, 
the the best example i, I mean you, you show a lot of pictures and i highly recommend people looking at them um but there are two examples that i think are particularly important um one is that um is in this attractor sense where the system can bounce around and does between one state and another state in a in a in an unpredictable way uh, but it, but it, you know, it's either in one or another. They're, 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 one state or another is an attractor. It's the way I think of it, and and um, and it does that if you follow it. If you follow it on a computer, it bounces around. But if you add noise, you basically can have it. You can see how it, instead of all of the conflicting stuff of the transition back and forth, it more or less stays in one state and then jumps to another state, and you can see right. explicitly that bimodal distribution comes out much more dramatically than than if you didn't add right. noise which i think is a, a and a... and uh since since you mentioned it earlier lawrence i mean one of the bits i took out of the book uh just because it was getting that chapter was getting too long was actually about milankovitch uh cycles yeah, you know yeah. we talked about the ice ages and um it's long been a puzzle because you know as you say the the milankovitch cycle is kind of related to the the change in the solar forcing, you know, due to some due to due to orbital, you know, very low low frequency, you know, hundred thousand year time scale changes in the orbit of the Earth, very very predictable and periodic. But when you calculate the change in the kind of solar forcing, it's just tiny, tiny, tiny. And for a long time, people couldn't understand how, you know, an ice age could develop from such a, a small change in in solar forcing. But it turns out there's a theory called uh, uh, stochastic resonance, which is basically along the lines of what you've just talked about, that adding noise uh, to a small external forcing can really amplify it. And here the noise is coming from the internal kind of weather dynamics of the climate system. And the two the two uh, lobes, what do you call attractors? I just call them kind of no, wings lobes. of the attractor or something. Um, you could think of the ice ages and the and the kind of interglacials, um, and we're getting this amplification from this, you know, from the internal effect of the noise of weather systems, you know, interacting with this Milankovitch cycle. So, so that's another example of how you know we believe noise playing a crucial role in explaining the the, the sort of paleoclimate uh, record of of the Earth's uh, climatic history. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that that's that's great, and and. And that never made it to the final yeah, version. Yeah, of the but, it, but, but, you know, but jumping between these widely different systems, in some sense, it's the noise stabilizes the system in one case, but it also allows the, the rapid transitions, which is what right. one's right. talking about the Milankovitch cycle. The other, right. the other example, which I think maybe I, I'm going to try and we'll see if we can try and talk our way through it without a picture, but right. it, it, where, where, where adding noise um, is, is relevant, actually, I guess I could put it this way. I'll, I'll describe it differently than you, you, you do in your book. But um, uh, if you want to, if you're climbing a mountain and you want to get to the top, but as you can't see the top, and and there's a lot of hills and valleys in between, you got to figure out how to get to the highest point. And um, and one way is always only always go up. And the right. minute you start to go down, stop going. But then, of course, what that will do, and it's well known in the case of mathematics, but also in the case of climbing, will get you to a local point where you're on a local hill and you may not be the highest. Right. Better would be to send out a lot, if you've got a Boy Scout troop, to send out a lot of Boy Scouts and say, well, you know, don't worry so much. Sometimes, you, you know, if you're going down, you know, it's okay. Uh, you know, that that's not what you really want to do, but it's okay, but maybe it'll take you to another place. And you point right. out, of course, that's 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 this process called simulated annealing. But but it's the way it's very important in a complicated system when you're looking at a computer to find a maximum or a minimum that you, and not to get stuck in in local red herrings right. to allow your system to have some noise. So it jumps from, it, you know, it jumps from what you might think would be the best place to another place that might be worse. But then but that may then take you up to the to the to, to the high point and and. And uh, it's a it's a really important example of of right. how to find your way in a system where you can't see where you're going in some sense. And I think you know personally, uh, you may not agree, Lawrence, but personally, I think that kind of uh, explains to some extent the way in which we think our way around problems. You know, when we're still yep. at the early stages of trying to solve a problem, 
we'll kind of, you know, we'll we'll be prepared to go back to zero and try again and try a different route and so on. When we're getting pretty close to the, we, we think we're pretty close to the problem, then we'll, we'll be more, more discerning, if you like, about the crazy ideas um, that right, we accept, right. you know. And I, so I think there is, you know, it seems to me that that has that kind of example has resonance um, in a, in many different areas, and maybe maybe human cognition. And oh, by the absolutely. way, I think you know evolution in general, maybe also the way you know that works in evolutionary terms. Yeah, as well. I was certainly trying, yeah, lo trying lots of different options early on. Is yeah, when and especially when you haven't got a lot of time invested in it, it's right. even easier. Right. That, I mean, I think that's psychological when you haven't invested a lot of time in its early right. stages. Why not? Right. Why not just try all all, all of the all of the uh, uh, possibilities? Right. One of the, the other facet of science, I will since you gave me one example the other important thing that i've learned having at one point created a master's program in physics entrepreneurship for my university um is that the other thing that's useful is you can sometimes find you, that you when you're solving a problem that you got to a point where you solved it but it's not really the problem you want to solve and what you learn if you're a scientist is often is how to use that problem you've solved to solve something else, not right. to give up on it. But it's but, you know, you've got to a right. local maximum and it's not right. taking you where you want to go. But you know what? Right. That can be useful somewhere else. And that happens right. a lot. It happens a lot in science. It happens a tremendous right. amount in business. And right. I think it's important. But this notion of, of, of adding noise called stochastic rounding, I think, is, is really kind of interesting. Now, before we get uh, I want to go on for about another half hour or so, I think. Sure. Um, can I think uh, um, there's a there's not a digression, but but when one is talking about uncertainty and noise, one cannot help but talk about at some level at a basic level quantum mechanics. Right. And the fact is, people know that quantum mechanics has uncertainty. They've heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. They've heard right. that there's that the quantum mechanics the, the central you can almost define quantum mechanics by recognizing there are certain combinations of quantities. Right. Which, which have an intrin have an intrinsic uncertainty that you cannot measure that combination. Both right. you can measure position, then right. you won't know the momentum or the velocity, right. and but you can right. measure velocity, but you won't know the position exactly. Right. And that is an that is a central premise of quantum mechanics. And the big, right. the big, um, the big, the big question which interests you. Right. Not much. Not many others in the physics community. There are a few deep people who are worrying about this question. Is whether that's really true? Whether, as Einstein thought, that uncertainty was what you call I, these are must be come from philosophers because I, I one of them is epistemic. Whether that right. uncertainty is epistemic, as you call it, which means that's just a property of us not knowing. We don't have a good enough right. measuring device, or we don't know all the stuff that's happening. If we get do it better, that uncertainty will go down. Or whether right. it's quote ontological, which means right. it's inherent to nature, right. and the and the, and the difference between Einstein and Bohr was Bohr's argument that it, and, so, and the rest of the physics community's argument that it was intrinsic to nature, as you right. call ontological, and Einstein saying no, no, it's really there's really some theory, which if you knew things well enough, you could reproduce this seemingly crazy behavior of quantum mechanics. Um, right. All of the crazy, spooky action at a distance, and right. some people would call it non-locality, which some people like to think of. I, I don't think you need to think. Anyway, um, uh, uh, and and Einstein thought, oh, and he constantly presented these great Gedanken experiments to point out potential problems with how illogical or how irrational quantum mechanics would be if you took this notion that that uncertainty was was ontological or inherent to nature, and right and took it to its large greens. And what's happened is each of his crazy experiments where he said, look, this, this would be insane um, because this is what would be required. When you do it. That's what happens. The insanity happens. And, 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 and the, well, the, be the best, let me, let me get you give an example. I'm just going to throw this out and I'm going to give you a chance to chat because yeah. I know in the early part of the book and then in the later part of the book, which we won't have time to get to, you argue, let, let's make it clear, you think it's ultimately ep epistemic in some sense. I you do. don't think, you think that not only is nature not, does not, God not play with dice in that sense, but that uncertainty is, is, is also related to the nature of our ability to understand ultimately the quantum mechanics associated with general relativity, that the two of them are tied together. So that's a premise you try and make later in the book. But let's just get back to good old quantum mechanics.
And the experiment that's often used to show how fundamentally different quantum mechanics is from any kind of theory, you know, it has to do with the spin of a particle. Right. And, and, and of course, the two examples are the, the standard double slit experiment from the, the true polymath Thomas Young, of a, one of a, a British uh, right. doctor and physicist and many other things, who, right. um, who pointed out that, that and the, the typical experiment in quantum mechanics is if you send light through two slits, you'll see what's called an interference pattern because light is behaving wave light. But now having detectors of light, the, you see that light is made of particles. And if you try and measure each particle of light called a photon as it goes through, the pattern you see is very different. And, 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 um, and so, um, uh, but, but the really weird thing is that if you send one particle at a time and don't measure it, you'll get the same pattern as you would have for a wave. So somehow the particle appears to be going through both slits at the same time. That's the, that's one weirdness of quantum mechanics, but the other has to do with another experiment related to the spin of, of say, uh, of, of say uh, a single particle electron it acts like it's spinning. It's, it's not really spinning, but it has the uh, angular momentum like it's spinning. Right. And, and quantum mechanics, the traditional notion of quantum mechanics tells us that the particle is spinning in some sense in all directions at the same time. And, and, and when you measure it, and there's a probability that it'll be spinning in the direction you measure it. And, and all other things being equal, the probability of any direction is the same. So, so if you can measure whether the spin is pointing up or down, you'll measure it's pointing up 50% of the time and down 50% of the time. That's fine. That makes sense. You do the experiment. You measure things up pointing up 50% of the time, down 50% of the time. I'm trying, by the way, just so readers, listeners know, I'm trying to set up the diagram that you talk about in your book. I'm not trying to take over this discussion. Right. But... but um, so 50% of the time it go up, 50% of the time it go down. But the weird thing about quantum mechanics then says, well, if you then subsequently measure the particle and now ask, measure it along a different axis, say the up and down axis is the Z direction or Z direction if in Europe or Canada, right. um, and, and you want to look at the Y direction, you now have a detector that says, what's the component of the spin in the Y direction? Well, now having done it and shown it was spinning up, you now measure it and you find out 50% of the time you'll find out the spin and is pointing in in one in one direction of the y axis and then the other direction of the y axis okay that's really weird but then having done that you then go back and measure the spin whether point up or down and now you find out that what you thought you'd already measured it you'd measured having a spin up but now when you do a subsequent measurement you find out 50% of the time it's pointing up and 50% of the time it's pointing down telling you that it apparently telling you it didn't have you couldn't think of it as having had some intrinsic spin in the in in the z direction or z direction during the times when you weren't measuring it because if it had you would you'd always get 100 percent of the time it was pointing spin up if you'd started this it showed it was spin up at the beginning of the experiment this this is this intrinsic uncertainty that results is often is is by most physicists taken to be an a, a, a classical a, a, I shouldn't say classical a, a a prototypical example of 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 the intrinsic uh, Heisenberg uncertainty or the the intrinsic what you call ontological uncertainty of nature that the particle literally as Feynman would have said is doing many things at the same time whether you like it or not and 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 the epistemic argument is no it's doing one thing when you're not measuring it and we just don't know what that one thing is. And um, and there are lots of experiments, and the Nobel Prize was given this year for a set of experiments, a whole generation of experiments that continue to test these weird notions of of uh, uh, um, of, of what's called Bell's inequality experiments that that uh, you can show an ex classically if it, if the particle was doing something specific you get one result of it. It's not doing something specific. You get another result. I, I should say, I, I don't know if you know, do you know Sidney Coleman? Uh, um, in, uh, yeah. It, uh, uh, he would argue, and I would too, that if, if I think if when we're writing it again, the Bell's inequality is less convincing than another inequality, which is really dramatic, where you, you get a plus one in, in the case of, 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 of classical physics and a minus one in the case of quantum mechanics, you always get minus one. But in any case, these are the set of experiments that that tell us that quantum mechanics is intrinsically, I would say, 
the, the and I think the majority, and I also say we accept that that nature has this fact that 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 unlike classically, particles are not doing one thing at any time; they're doing many things at the same time. Okay. Now you would argue. Let me let me turn over to you, and you'd say, okay, yeah. well that's that's true in a in a in a in a in an analysis where you take things at face value, that's a fact. But let's not take things at face value, is what you would say. Okay. Well, and, well, I yeah, I mean, what what I would say is, if you come to me with a, uh, I mean, it's all very well arguing, you know, you, I mean, you know, you you talked about this in a heuristic way. I mean, we have mm -hmm. to do that because we're we're talking, you know, to a broad audience, but yeah. yeah. If we were to get serious about this, I would ask you, you know, to write down uh, your assumptions very, very, very carefully, um, and I would, I would tell you uh, because I think it's true whether it's Bell's inequality or you know the the plus one minus one that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. There are a whole load of these yeah, what are called yeah. no go theorems. At some stage, you will make a kind of an assumption which you may not even realize you're making. Which mm -hmm. is about a world, a world that didn't happen, but that might have happened if you had done an experiment differently. Yes. Um, and I use the phrase counterfactual, you know, which uh, historians use and philosophers use. Um, and it raises the question, uh, uh, and I don't have, you know, we don't have time to go into this because we'll run over very quickly. But but let me just just take that, if you like, as as a mm. as a fact. So now. Um, what I would say to you is that there's an interesting thing about these chaos, these models of chaos yeah. with their fractal attractors, which is yeah. that the fractals, we're not talking about like a big solid volume. We're talking about things with gaps in them. And the, 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 the question is, could it be that these counterfactual worlds lie in the gaps in the, in the fractal geometry? Yeah. And I would claim to have a model, a possible model. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not claiming it's the truth or anything, but I think it's a plausible model of quantum mechanics where these counterfactuals do indeed fall in the gaps. And what it means is that your theory says this is not a, this is not a permissible hypothetical experiment. You know, so so this is a kind of a loophole which is almost never uh, discussed in the standard literature. It's kind mm. of assumed that we can talk about counterfactual, you know, you're, you have a theory which admits counterfactual worlds without any restriction at all. And I think, you know, I think that is a mistake. That is where our, you know, our interpretation of these various no-go theorems is incomplete. And mm -hmm. if I'm right, then yeah, Einstein may well be vindicated after all, and that you know the uncertainty really is not inherent. You know, God does not play dice, but it's our lack of knowledge, if you like, that creates the uncertainty. Now, I realize this is super speculative and so on and so forth, but you have to remember I started off in, in quantum gravity, yeah, and, and I come very much from the view that general relativity is a remarkably beautiful non-linear causal mm -hmm. theory mm -hmm. uh, and that the problem in trying to marry the two theories may be less to do with general relativity and more to do with quantum mechanics so that's yeah. that's a bias uh, i i admit to that well, but that's where well, i'm coming from yeah exactly well and the, i always frame the bias was that if the only tool you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail and and <laughs> and and, and, and i think it's really important i mean i i can see the logical analysis in your book and it's for that the because you spent so much time with these fractal geometries and it is true that that while you know you can see these surfaces there's some there's some motions that just are not allowed to happen right and right. and and that trend but let me make it and you use a similar example in your book so i want to make it clear in in some sense it's like saying that well, be, because that, you know, the quantum, the quantum reality, the reality we experience, which I'll call, let's say quantum reality is such that the, um, that the, that the present measurement of the spin of this electron is somehow kind of tied to whether your grandmother, um, your grandmother, you know, married your, your grandfather at some, I mean, and, and there's a, there, so that, and you can say, well, you know what would have happened if that hadn't happened, but that's not allowed. The only well, the only reality is that she married. That's allowed is that she is the correlated fact that she married your grandfather and you measured the spin up. 
And in some yeah, sense, sorry. The, the 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 point is that the spin is is intimately 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 related to the measurement that you made on that spin. Yeah. And yeah. that the measurement that you made is ultimately linked to what your grandfather and grandmother okay. did or didn't do. Yeah. Um, and and that's by the way, you know, I mean, that's what's called a contextual theory, and that yeah. that's well well known. That if you yeah. if you got to if you if you have anything which explains quantum mechanics, it it has to be what's called contextual. So, you know, in some sense, the the properties of the particles are there is an inherent relationship with the with the measurement properties, um, and you know, I, well, anyway, look. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So the, the, I think that you know to do more would require yeah. probably more complexity. I, I think right. that. Fundamental difference, and maybe I, I've already said this before. I was, I was sort of influenced by by Sydney, and I talk yeah. about it in my new book. It, it that I, I think part of the problem is people want the world to be classical, and they want right. to talk about interpretations of, of quantum mechanics, and that's the wrong thing to do. The world the, is quantum mechanical, and we always are driven to these nutty pictures because we right. we insist on thinking of a world that we can picture classically. And the right thing to do is think of the interpretation of classical mechanics. And, and I would just say that these these fractal geometries are not really classical. I wouldn't yeah. describe them as classical. You, you say and that they, in the book. They I know I go into this in a little bit of detail. They incorporate things like non-computable, you know, determinism yeah, yeah. and and, uh, and the mathematics of, of piadic numbers and all this sort of stuff, which is not really part of normal classical physics. So, yeah. so this isn't a classical. This isn't a classical view I'm trying to put over, but yeah, I am yeah. trying to say that Einstein was not, maybe not wrong to be concerned both about spooky action at a distance and, and you know, dice playing deities. Yeah, yeah. And well, if it's a solution, the I'm, I'm, anyway, I won't say, I, well, I will say <laughs> it. it. You know, sometimes the question is the solution worse than the problem. But anyway, um, I will argue, and something I would love to talk to you afterwards, and maybe we'll do another program on this at some point. Uh, you, you give a cosmological argument, and I've already debated some of the cosmology with Roger, Roger Penrose, about how our expanding universe may be an illusion in some sense. I mean, I think, I think there are good cosmological arguments that aren't taken into account that argue that that's not, that, would, that I hope I could convince you would argue that's not the case. But anyway, that'll be you and I talking cosmology at some point. But, it, but now I want to get back to the heart. I want to end in the last sort of 20 minutes or so talking about getting from weather to climate. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and you talk about, I mean, I didn't realize the first weather prediction was in 1861 is that right um um uh the first kind of effort to make a weather prediction um robert uh, fitzroy and yeah uh, yeah what robert fitzroy tell me about him uh by the way i had an email out of the blue from a great 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 grandson of robert fitzroy who'd read just read my book which uh, oh, oh that's great <laughs> rather nice yeah that is good uh, he I mean, was the captain of the Beagle, which um, took yes. Darwin around the world. Um, came back. He was obviously interested in weather and uh, set up the, the 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 first British Met Office. Um, I mean, his 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 uh, his contribution really was to systematize the observations of weather around the around the coast uh, and to feed them in using the the new kind of wireless to, to, uh, you know technology to a kind of a central location and all these observations could then be synthesized together uh to form a kind of a, a weather map of the of the you know the pressure the isobars and everything and then fitzroy would use his kind of rules of thumb he didn't have obviously a computer model but rules of thumb to sort of try to work out how the weather would evolve um but what that i mean the point about fitzroy is he kind of showed that one crucial Part of a weather forecast are the observations. You can't do anything unless you have the observations of the weather today to get the weather tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. That's a key part. But then, but then, um, the observations alone need to be need to be supplemented not just by theory, but by the recognition that the system is, as you point out, nonlinear. You, in, in a, a sentence in the where you first talk about that, you say, "What is what is it after all that distinguishes science from pseudoscience?" Right. Surely one key feature is an ability to handle uncertainty to mes right. estimate error bars. Weather forecasting inside the limit of deterministic predictability had no reliable means of estimating these error bars. And I think right. the central point you want to talk about is that one had to go beyond a deterministic model to right. a model that uh, explicitly accounted for uncertainties in an ensemble way to produce right. the weather forecasting we do today, which you played a key role in helping develop. So why don't you why don't you give us a little bit of that story? Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit, but 
uh, I mean, basically, it it kind of seemed obvious to me that 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 we needed to do something like this. But um, the real problem was, you know, there were competing uses for the computers because this was computationally intensive. You know, running fifty forecasts is is computationally intensive compared to running one. Yeah. Um, we were helped. I have to say, my case was helped a little bit by the fact that the emerging supercomputer technology was was of kind of a ma massively parallel, where you have you know many thousands of, of individual processors, and this was a problem that's sometimes called embarrassingly parallel because mm -hmm. you really don't need the forecasts don't have to communicate with each other yeah. till they get to the end. So technology helped me a little bit. I have to say uh, because of that. Um, but uh, yeah, the prevailing, you know, the prevailing view uh, from the sort of fathers of numerical weather prediction was that as long as you're less than about two weeks, then it, you, you know, the, the problem is deterministic. And and I, you know, that Lorentz model, the figure that you showed, was it ten or mm, something? Yeah, just kind yeah. of de de debunks that immediately. You, you can, you know, um, you'll have situations where even after a day. Um, you can lose predictability, and the famous Michael Fishstorm kind of brought it home. I think. I think you know nature. You know where where I was kind of not didn't do a very good job in convincing my colleagues about this. Nature, nature kind of uh, spoke yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in 1987, and that that I think convinced everyone we had to we had to go down a different route. And, that and you know, and nowadays, of course, it's it's. Uh, everywhere in the, in the world, every every weather forecast center around the world now runs ensemble forecasts. But what's really exciting, I mean, the thing that's really exciting me at the moment is that the way this is changing, the way disaster relief agencies and humanitarian yeah. agencies now act, you know, in the old days, and old days only means a few years ago, uh, they would only supply, you know, they would only go into a region that was hit by a hurricane or a tropical cyclone or something, you know, after the event. And, you know, and then it was often difficult to get medicine and food and so on to, to places that have been stricken because all the roads would be down, the communications would be down and so on. So how much better would it be to go in ahead of time? The problem is that these agencies are not rich, you know, they don't, they don't kind of have money coming out of, the, out of their ears. So, um, if they go in, you know, and nothing happens, it's a false alarm, then they've potentially wasted a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So they need a, an objective criterion for determining uh, when to go in ahead of time, when to take what's called anticipatory action, and when not. And probabilities, these ensemble based probabilities give them a precise objective criterion. Now they do their cost benefit analysis and they say, okay, if the probability exceeds, you know, 75% or something, we know from our, you know, from that cost benefit analysis that it's worth going in ahead of time. We can, we can take the odd, you know, false alarm, but we know that 75% of the time we're going to be ahead. And so they have an objective criterion where they have these uh, what they call probability triggers for determining when they go in. Uh, and this is really saving lives and affecting people who, you know, who otherwise would, uh, would, would either, well, they may perish or they would certainly be leading very uncomfortable lives, potentially for days or weeks, waiting for food and water and medicine and so on. Yeah. So that's a fantastically interesting and, you know, great example about how this has completely revolutionized the way in which people use weather forecasts. Yes, and it, I'm glad you got there because I want to talk. I wanted to get there. You talk about it later on in the book that that it's re when we talk about risk, but these that it's actually being used. That probabilities are which which I want to come back to and parse a little more carefully in a moment are really being used. And it's an example how I always like to tout the fact that none of the physics I've ever done has any practical significance whatsoever. <laughs> and and it's an example of how that bifurcation, how that butterfly effect in your life changed from physicists who would have talked about fascinatingly interesting, perhaps, ideas to some people, to a physicist who may, who whose work ultimately can save people's lives, which I just think is must be incredibly yeah. satisfying. And it all came out of that that figure 10, you know, of the Lorentz yeah, model, yeah. seeing that Lorentz model and realizing, yeah. you know, this, this can happen to the real world just as much as it happens to the Lorentz model. And it's interesting, by the way, that these ensembles, in some sense, um, do exactly what you think the quantum world doesn't do. But I mean, what the ensembles do is say, let's let's run 50 different realities and see in how many of those realities something happens. And uh, and 
and it it's it's really nothing oh well it's a lot i mean in detail it's more than that but in principle nothing more than that and it's really kind of amazing because one of the things one of the more impressive figures and is is one where you actually look at that poor event of october 16th 1987 and show how taking the data available and running ensemble forecasts namely running forecasts for many different models over a short period a 12-hour period um shows you that given those initial conditions and the nonlinear aspects condition there are a certain number of those final configurations that something really dramatic will happen something totally mm -hmm. dramatic like an incredible storm the worst in 300 yeah. years and 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 that's the sense in which one means probability so i want to go into this because although you have great confidence that farmers in poor countries understand probability and you talk about their ability to to do that in terms of of of, of their actions it's i think relatively well known and i know steve pinker has written a lot about this that that and all of us that prob people don't handle probabilities intrinsically very well especially um uh well, especially when the probabilities are small and 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 hard to intuitively understand. So the probability of rain or of of a of a cyclone being ten percent isn't that there's a cyclone in ten percent of the places, right? I mean, on a given ten percent of the area that you're looking at no. in that day, no. um, right. and it and it, it it is rather that in if you have a hundred worlds. Um, all of which have the initial conditions within your ability to know them. They're all equally it, plausible. They're apparently. all equally plausible, and ten of them will have a cyclone. Right, and that's that's, that's right. the way to understand this sort of frequentist idea of probability, I guess. And 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 um, and that means, and then you have to ask yourself. Uh, I've now said it a few times in in, in discussion with people. Of my my favorite favorite lines when talking about climate change to some people who don't want to do anything comes from uh, movies of uh, Dirty Harry. I don't know if you ever saw Clint Eastwood movie Dirty Harry. Oh, yeah, movie. yeah, yeah. But where he it's, points, he's, the, gun yeah, yeah. Is, the gun may be empty, empty. He said, I don't know, the gun may be empty. I may have you all. Are you feeling lucky, punk? Right. And ultimately, right. we've got to ask ourselves that question if it's something catastrophic. Right. Are you feeling lucky enough that if it's, even if there's only a 10% probability, you're willing right. to say, ah. And and But the fact that one can, I think the point the, that, 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 that weather forecasting has proceeded from saying this will happen or this won't happen to saying that with a probability and the probability means something. And then right. you yourself can make the decision of whether that probability uh, right. uh, is worthwhile. And you know, there's another great figure here where you show the, 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 um, the motions of different, of different cyclones, of different hurricanes. Right. Again, all intrinsically, obviously nonlinear and turbulent and everything else. Right. But on some of them, you can look at these ensembles and they all more or less go in the same direction. In other words, other ones, they diverge quickly. And it's important to know that that's possible right. and when it's possible if you're talking right. about people's lives. Right. And, and, and it's a wonderful discussion. But now I want to go to I want to go from there, from weather to climate, which has been the next area you've gone in. And I want to and I really want to sort of lead it to our our discussion of risk analysis at the end. Which means we're going to skip pandemics and economics, but that's okay, because I, okay. I I think I, I think I've when you read your book, I think it's make it clear that while one might want to apply these things to economics, one could if economics was a science, but it doesn't seem like economics is science. So, economics case, is moving well. Economics is moving more slowly uh, than than uh, than uh, I had thought actually when I started writing the chapter, but but yeah. it's moving maybe moving in the right direction. But maybe. yeah, let's I'm talk more about I'm more pessimistic than you, but but okay. But in any case, um, but. I was, that's why it's okay to ignore them. I want climate. We can We shouldn't ignore, and right. is a real issue, and is an area right. where, I, and I wrote a whole book about it, saying it's right. science. It's right. not. It's not. It, 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 climate science is not fundamentally different than other science. That's right. the first thing. There are there are aspects of it that make it different than some other aspects, but there's some of it you can say you can you can address exactly like uh, a, a ball rolling downhill, and some of it you have to use more sophisticated techniques for, right. and. Um, and in in my book, the physics of climate change, I tried to focus on those things where you where you could where you could understand like a ball rolling down a hill to see that you know these are well tested and two hundred year old ideas. Um, right. But one of the one of the important aspects. So you're, one of the things that you've worked on and and you talk about at great length is a is a is a whole and and what is now the de rigueur in in climate modeling is 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 ensemble forecasting that right. that 
that what is done by the IPCC and all major groups in the world is to run, you know, when a complicated system like the climate has billions of parameters and, um, and you can't possibly deterministically know the answer or even estimate the uncertain, the, 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 what the probabilities are the result of without actually running them and right. finding what the answer is. So you run many ensembles. And right. one of the things that I think is really an important, I, I want to pick up one of the most, what I think is the most important points that you raise, which should be sobering to people. And that is in nonlinear systems where you have effects that, um, you know, uncertainties that can produce different things like the future temperature, if you double the carbon dioxide abundance on earth, right. one can have a model that has a most likely, the most likely answer, which may be two or three degrees, and everyone will agree that's the most likely possibility. But in fact, if you look at all the models, there's always a spread in nonlinear systems to the possibility of more extreme, right? Uh, more extreme numbers. And therefore, if you take the mean value, which is right. different than the most likely value, right. the mean right. value is the is the weighted average of all of those things. That right. value is generically higher in almost right. all nonlinear systems. And that's right. a very important point. So the so that when one says, well, the most likely um, uh, effect of doubling carbon dioxide may be two degrees Celsius or two and a half degrees Celsius. That may be a true statement, but what you find is the mean value in a, in a hundred different universes where you're, where you have that climate is actually three or four degrees. Right. And that, that's very sobering. So I, right. I, I just want to, you can elaborate on that, but that was, I think an incredibly important point. If, is there anything you want to add to that? I learned it from you, so I should, say that already. well i mean you're you're describing what's called a skewed distribution and as you say it's very indicative of of nonlinear systems in other words that the you know the distribution drops much more quickly on one side and it and it extends uh, to a great long fat tail on the other side and of course the problem is you know compounding this is that the the impacts of climate change on you know, on society and on ecosystems and so on, that increases very non-linearly with uh, temperature. So these, even though these tails, you know, the probabilities are getting smaller and smaller, uh, the impacts are getting larger and larger. And then you're faced with a, you know, an awkward problem of multiplying, you know, a small number by a big number. And we're not quite sure whether that will end up being small or big. But, um, yeah, the I think, and by the way, um, I I made exactly the same point in the in the in the chapter on COVID. Yeah, that you you see, you know, the COVID models also show these tales of high hospitalizations and high deaths. So if you're trying to formulate policy, it's actually misleading to be guided solely by the most likely prediction of hospitalization and death. It's exactly the same problem as with climate change. And one way of, of, as you say, of kind of quantifying that is to compute the difference between the mean and the and the most likely. Um, but, you know, the truth of the matter is really what this is all about is, you know, ha what is it worth to avoid, you know, getting anywhere in that tail where things, you know, I use the example of four degrees as I yeah. think, you know, even a, even a kind of really... D died in the wool sort of climate denier would have to kind of admit that if we ever got to a four degree warmer world it would be pretty catastrophic for well, i mean i don't I think, think i, I don't think humanity would, would go extinct but we would be leading dramatically different lives to what i think the thing you point out which is a, which i know of but it's an important point is is this is it, it is true that there if the if the if the uh, if the climate if the worldwide global average temperature increased by four degrees, there'll be significant places around the world that will simply be impossible to live in. Namely, right. this dew point, this fact that 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 it, with a certain humidity and a certain temperature, human bodies cannot keep themselves cool, and it's physically right. impossible to live. And that's just a that's a property of biology and physics, and you can't deny it. Right. And there will that's be right. many many places and many times throughout the year that's where. Right where there'll be uninhabitable places on earth, which is That's right. certainly, I mean, there are still places where you die easily if you go to the, you know, the, the various deserts and, 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 you know, you, yeah. but, but there, there are places where even in principle, there's yeah. nothing you can do, you know, in, if you're outside that you, and, and to survive. That's and right. that's, so, that's, that's, that's sobering enough. But then there's this quite, then there's this point 
just like in all nonlinear systems, that there are these other more extreme, even more extreme, in fact, not four degrees, but more extreme changes. And in fact, uh, I, I just finished a, a, a podcast, and I happen to know this from having been in Greenland, where you know that you know there are these ice cores that show that at times ten to twelve thousand years ago, you see these incredible changes of ten to eighteen degrees and variations right. back and forth as the system is becoming unstable. And those right. kind of things, you know, four degrees, you might say, well, no climate, no one would, would say it is disastrous. But 18 degrees is disastrous by any means. And and other other nonlinear effects, such as the melting of of of, uh, of of the Greenland ice sheet, which would change sea levels by 20, 21 feet or so. All of these things are possible and one can one can not maybe not the Greenland ice sheet melting, but one can at some level talk about the, the fact that there are probabilities and try and estimate the probabilities that things might happen. And then you yeah. gotta ask yourself whether you're feeling lucky punk. And and right. and, and it, you give a you give a story which is uh, which is sobering. And I, I guess I it's a page long. So l let me read it because I think it uh, it really gives a feeling for the final thing I want to talk about, which is this risk analysis. Are we right. are we going to do nothing? And you say, okay, well, suppose international climate change talks fail and carbon emissions keep rising. Attempts to cut emissions in the developed world are half-hearted, and developing world countries say they won't seriously contemplate cutting emissions until the standards of living of people in their countries have reached levels comparable to those of the richer countries. Temperatures keep rising but none more so than the western half of the United States, where wildfires become a yearly fact of life. Temperatures exceeding 50 degrees Celsius are commonplace around the world, including high latitude regions where such temperatures were previously unimaginable. Lake Mead has dried up and the Hoover Dam no longer produces electricity for large parts of the year. Wheat yields plummet, not just one year in 10, but pretty much every year. European countries are suffering similar problems with flooding events, which all destroy crops. A joint grouping of European and United States ministers comes to a conclusion. Something has to be done. They resort to plan B. In this plan, military aircraft from these countries fly continuously around the clock, spraying sulfuric acid vapor into the lower stratosphere. From this, sulfate aerosols are formed, which reflect sunlight back to Earth. The atmosphere now has a haze of aerosols, which it is hoped will offset the, uh, the effects of global warming and cool the atmosphere down. And as I learned from Elizabeth Colbert, will also mean the sky won't be blue. It'll be white. Right. They justify this action on the basis it will help humanity as a whole. However, the impact of such geoengineering on climate isn't as simple as it might at first seem. As is discussed in an earlier chapter, the global warming problem is caused because we're trapping electromagnetic radiation in the infrared part of the spectrum. Sulfate aerosols increase the reflection of sunlight in the visible parts of the spectrum. The one is not precisely offsetting the other. What could be the consequences of this? Um, this is an area where estimates from current generation models are unreliable. So back to the story, as you say. After several years of spraying, both Russia and India find that the atmospheric circulation patterns over their countries have changed in such a way that rain-bearing weather systems no longer track across the main agricultural reasons. Crops fail. The India and Russia blame the failures on the U.S. And then a, a big international study is done. I'm, I'm now going to just sort of paraphrase this. But it's inconclusive because the world hasn't yet spent enough money on the resources to to say what the answer is, and and eventually Russia and and, and India say we'll we'll shoot down planes that continue to do this because the thing about aerosol pumping is you continually have to do it because it don't la doesn't last in the atmosphere. First plane shot down, sanctions. Second plane, second plane shot down, airfields are bombed. Third one shot down. Eventually you add nuclear war in in here, and so it's a it's a it's a dystopic future. It's the yeah. butterfly effect in a, in another sense, but it is pointing out that yeah. while one can talk about with some probability temperatures, right. the probability talking about what the impact will be on humans is a very different story. And if you understand that the impacts of of climate variation, especially differential climate variation across the globe, can produce huge impacts on on human civilizations and on alterations of the geopolitical climate with the possibility of destabilizing the world in a disastrous way you've got to ask yourself are you feeling lucky punk and right. and 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 then you you have a chapter the next chapter is on this rational aspect of decision making which right. is probably risk analysis is probably one of i don't know if you'd agree with me here is one yeah. of the most 
non-intuitive um, when it especially comes to small probabilities aspect right. of being a human. Let, let me give you an example which sounds callous. I don't know if I've used it before, but I often think of this. So a bomber was on a plane and he was going to, he wanted to light his shoes on, on fire and make a bomb. And now every, and now built, hundreds of millions of people um, every, every day have to take their shoes off when they go uh, through airline security devices. And, right. and you have to ask, so you could ask yourself the following question. How many planes were bombed before this was done or, or might be bombed if this were done? And you say, well, maybe there were, you know, there's a Lockheed bomber. There were the lock, not Lockheed, lock, lock something bomber. Lockerbie. Lockerbie. Lockerbie bomber. And there were, you know, and there were other, and, 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 and of course there were the other terrorist tragedies like 9-11. And you ask, okay, well, ultimately, um, how many people were killed? And you say, mate, you come up with a number of maybe several thousands, several thousand, less than 10,000, but maybe. And then you say, how many people are flying every day? What's the probability of this happening, you might ask yourself, is it really worth having changed the economics and the and the and the the um, the quality of life for people who are flying? Or is it okay to let a few thousand people die every year? You know, there are a hundred million people flying every few days right. a, around the world. Now, that's a discussion you could have, and you might say even right. losing one person is too much. But the notion the fear that you're going to that this is going to happen is often misplaced. The fear that you're going to be killed by a terrorist if you live in the United States is so small. Right. As I once pointed out, it's more likely that you'll be have a refrigerator fall on you. Right. You know, and and so understanding okay. risk when it comes to these rare extreme events right. is something that that's right. not. But let, let me let me make a, a point here because I I kind of deliberately um, kept the chapter on climate change. You know the science. Let's call it the yeah. science of climate yeah. change. I kept that separate from the chapter on sure. risk. Yeah, and I did that for a very important reason, which I don't think is is sometimes fully appreciated. That you know, if you talk to me about uh, the science of climate change, I mean, I will try to give you, you know, the best information I can in a in a kind of neutral way. Uh, I, I'll try and tell you what the science says. But if you ask me then the question, does that mean we should cut our emissions? I'm kind of loath to give you an answer on that. I, I will say, well, okay, if you allow me to put my man in the street, you know, man in the pub hat on, where I don't particularly have any expertise, then I can tell you what I think. But uh, being a scientist doesn't actually, I don't think gives me any particular, you know, uh, reason to, or, you know, uh, pref you know, doesn't give me a like preferential status in, in, de in deciding that. So, it's like, you know, when the weather forecaster says the probability of a storm is 20 percent, that doesn't he can't he's not going to tell you or he or she is not yeah, going to yeah. tell you that means you shouldn't go out tomorrow or you yeah, shouldn't yeah. do X. It, that's your decision. And, you know, so it sort of annoys me a little bit when people say, oh, listen to the scientists or to, yeah. do what so, follow the science. The follow scientists the science. are not going to yeah. or they shouldn't be yeah. telling you uh, whether the science implies that uh you know, you should cut emissions. I mean, sub, my my good friend and colleague Sabina Hossenfelder put it yeah. rather more graphically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, um, "I like your, I like science." Your yeah, science does not tell you uh, not to pee on high voltage electricity cables. It just tells you that urine is a good conductor of electricity. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great, it's it's perfect. And I think, yeah, and there's um, another reason psychologically that separating right. them is very important. It's the reason. And it sounds well promoting, but it, but it, and maybe it is. But the reason the physics of climate change that book does not talk about policy yeah. is I've also discovered that people who want to who who want to deny climate change in some sense are doing so because they feel it's going to that it immediately leads to an infringement upon their rights. Yeah. What we need to do is scientists need to say here's what the science is, and then it's up to the public and exactly. if, uh, presumably an informed public, and then presumably informed legislators. None yeah. of which is necessarily true um, right. for them to make a rational decision. But the scientists can just say, indeed, that peeing on the, uh, you know, if you pee on the on the high voltage okay. wires, you, the, the, you know. And as I, you know, I say in the chapter on climate change, one of the biggest uncertainties in climate change is, is a very pedestrian problem of how do clouds, how yeah. are clouds going to respond to these increases in carbon dioxide? And depending on how the clouds respond, uh, you know, they could damp the effects of climate change. In other words, making it much less uh, important than we 
may have thought, or they could amplify it. And we, we don't really have a great deal of confidence in actually even knowing the sign of that feedback process. So, you know, it seems uh, to me... Although, let if, me interrupt for a second. I think you do suggest that more models predict a positive sign than a negative right. sign. Yeah. More, okay. more if, if you, if I, yeah, that's right. The, the, the probability is unfortunately get in the wrong direction, but nevertheless, there's a lot of uncertainty. I would say that is a very uncertain type yeah. of calculation. Yeah. And, you know, it seems to me that's where it's, I would have thought it's in the interests of, you know, people that may kind of viscerally hate the idea of climate change because of an infringe, you know, infringement in liberty or whatever, you know, it's in their interest to, uh, to fund the research on on climate, uh, you know, climate prediction and climate models to improve our ability to represent clouds, because, you know, who knows, it may turn out they were lucky, you know, if you like. Yeah. Um, but unless we do the science, we won't know. And uh, and we have to make then our judgments based on quite big estimates of uncertainty. The science, we could reduce those estimates of uncertainty if we, uh, I mean, I don't want to get on a hobby horse now, but you know, the funding of climate modeling is pretty woeful, actually, compared with many other things like yeah. the Large Hadron Collider right. or, the, yeah. you know, the James Webb Telescope yeah. or the uh, Square Kilometre Array. And if we put in that sort of money into climate modeling, we could have a much clearer picture about the future. And that doesn't seem to me like a particularly big deal, you know, when we when we fund these other big science projects. I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful moral to almost end this, which is the fundamental aspect. And what you learn is if you don't do the science, if you don't do the science, you, you don't know. And, right. and 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 right. and and what's what's great about the book is one talks about how the science has developed in a way that can potentially allow us to know and then right. ultimately there are human factors and that's where it comes into risk analysis you present it and it is mathematical but it's also yep. not mathematical namely right. It, right. you know at some level you could yep. say i'll be rational and my right. my and as you point out the simplest way to consider whether you're going to do something is the probability that something's going to happen times the impact it's that it's going to have and that impact right. might be financial or something right. else and 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 then ask yourself is it worth it and that's right. what the punk is doing when he's looking at them you know okay there's a small probability of one six but the impact is pretty big you end your life and yeah. and and that's in some sense a societal thing because it yeah. is touristic even though you know one can talk about what the impacts are for example you point out we can talk about the value of human life but but you know uh, or, or the impact on economics, but the, it's true that the econ impact on economics will be small, but that's because the third world already has a very small impact in economics. But yeah. but is it fair to say destroying their their livelihood completely? Well, that's not important because it's gonna it's not gonna have a huge global impact. Well, it's really important to them, and the right. P times L the P times right. L is very big for them, and so right. ultimately the science can give the P. Right. It can also right. give you some idea of the L, the the, right. the, the like, likelihood of devastation. Right. But ultimately, no, I, you know, we, we have to use both and only right. an informed analysis can allow you right. to make that decision. Your, and your point is that, you know, letting economists loose where their only metric is GDP yeah. may, may not be the, the right way to measure L. I think that's, yeah. that's the and, point. And, and uh, one of the great simplest examples I can think of is the one you brought up earlier, which I'm, I said we'd come back to at the end and we are now at the end. Um, having having gone quite a while, but I think uh, worthwhile quite a while, is uh, looking at asteroid impacts. Here's a great example. So right. the probability that an asteroid is going to impact on the Earth at a level that be civilization destroying is incredibly small, once every 100 million years or so on average. Okay, so don't, you know, you can go to sleep, you know, don't worry. It's not something you should worry about on a daily basis. One, uh, it's on one in 100 million years, um, but. The, but if it happens, you know, humanity and everything we've ever built, including Monte Carlo's and everything else, go away. Right. And that's right. for many people would consider it to be devastating. And right. so you might say, even though it's a very small probability, the 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 impact is huge. And therefore yeah. you say, well, OK, what? And then you ask, is it worth doing something about? And you ask, what does it cost? And it turns out it doesn't cost a lot to maybe defend right. us against right it's probably cost less to defend us against an asteroid i would argue than these wild arguments about moving people to mars so that we have so we have another civilization living there i think it's sure. a lot cheaper to defend ourselves but right. that's the kind of dialogue you can have that's the kind of thing that science can give us and right. in the area of of two areas that you might that that you might have thought um 
well, that are so complicated that you might have not thought you could do something about weather and climate. You talk yeah. about how science does allow us to deal with those and and yeah. and, and 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 why the primacy of doubt is is <laughs> the sign is 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 important. And I hope I've tried to give a sense of the many different areas, although we've left a few out and done justice to your um, yeah. to your fascinating book. So. In, well, you. uh, you've, uh, it's been great uh, talking with you. We, we, uh, we, as you say, we haven't covered everything, but maybe at a future date we can cover the bits that we didn't get through. But no, I think it's been uh, fascinating, and um, I think we're we're more or less in agreement, even yeah, over quantum. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm saying we didn't, you know, this quantum and cosmology. We'll leave that. I, I don't right. think we are. But someday, uh, okay. I'd love to have an argument to convince you I'm right, but I don't think I will. <laughs> and, and but anyway, but the important stuff, the namely, well. From a fundamental understanding, obviously it's important to know the fundamental way nature works. But yeah. from the stuff that that is going to impact on people's daily lives, I think we really, you know, yeah. did do our in complete agreement. And it's a and it's a really interesting way to try and understand the science of uncertainty. And um, so, yeah, thanks for giving us. Which I which I yeah. began this podcast by saying to me that's the least understood and least appreciated aspect of science. But I appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.